pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Francisco? Here. Hotchkiss? Here. House? Here. Maria? Here. Rouse? Here. White? Here. Mayor Snyder? Here. Is there any public comment for items not on the agenda today? No, there aren't, Madam Mayor. Okay, so we'll move. I believe we're doing the city attorney's office first. Mr. Wiley. Madam Mayor, members of the council, thank you. This is the uh, city attorney's uh, budget presentation for fiscal year 2014. Uh, preliminarily, uh, let me say the obvious, that uh, uh, we don't, uh, unlike public works, we don't build bridges, we don't fix streets, we don't run traffic signals. Even uh, compared to Parks and Rec, we don't run softball programs or dance classes or maintain our parks. Uh, we're, we're obviously, as attorneys, we're somewhat like the uh, departments, if you will, in City Hall. We advise the city council, we advise the city department heads and the city administrator. And so our work product is, is words. Uh, sometimes that's uh, verbal advice, sometimes, hopefully uh, more often than not le written legal advice. Sometimes that's in the drafting of ordinances and contracts. And other than providing advice and providing words to the city council and to the city, the other major function we, we have is we, we go to court for the city. We obviously, as attorneys, that's our role to primarily defend the city in court. Fortunately, the city is, uh, we're pretty good at that. The city is easy to defend. And at times, we also are in court as prosecutors. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation, very little. Uh, but this next slide, I, I, I always like to include this because um, you have seen, you will see occasionally that our office budget is about 2% of the general fund. At $2 million, we're about, about in rough terms, 2% of the general fund. But actually, we're, of course, we don't only advise the general fund and, and uh, the enterprise funds and special revenue funds. Uh, even at times, the internal service funds generate a need for legal advice. They need lawyers to advise them. So I think it's, a, it's just a good indication of uh, the value that the city gets uh, from our office that we're, let's say, less than 1% of the overall city budget. You know, the, if you look at the city as a quarter of a billion dollar organization, which it truly is, quarter of a billion dollar legal entity, we are the lawyers for that entity, and we are able to do that for well under 1% of the total budget. And, and I, you know, I say that, obviously, as a full-service city that runs an airport and a harbor and a police department and a fire department, and we give all of them advice, uh, and we're readily available for them. And uh, without a whole lot of uh, retaining of special outside legal counsel, and... Um, I'm hoping to keep this pretty short, but I, I do want to say that in, in my experience in municipal law, this is a trend that's changing, and it's a trend that's of concern to a lot of cities and city councils, the cost of outside legal counsel. And um, it's enormous for cities like Los Angeles or San Francisco or counties like Los Angeles. And uh, we're, we're very cognizant of the fact and proud of the fact that we don't use, we don't need to use special counsel very often in the city. At times we have to because of the, their special expertise. Uh, but we try to keep that to a minimum and to when it's absolutely necessary. So in terms of our role, and, and this is our mission statement, uh, I feel very serious about all of these things, particularly just giving uh, frank and understandable legal advice to um, uh, city staff to the city council. Uh, it, it, you know, I think lawyers are often accused of, uh, on the one hand, this, on the one, on the other hand, that. And I, I don't think that's helpful. I, I, at the same time, though, as the city attorney, uh, and I, I know the attorneys in our office, we're proud of the fact that we're attorneys. And in a way, we rely on that. It's, it's, it's nice as an attorney at times to say, I don't have to make the hard decisions. I'm not getting paid 
to make the hard decisions. The city council makes those decisions, or Jim Armstrong makes those decisions, and the department heads. We just give the advice. And I, I, but I do like to have good, frank, understandable, common sense advice, and then let the decision makers make their decisions. And I feel strongly about uh, this, our role as wordsmiths for the city, for, uh, uh, you know, when there's uh, a comprehensive or a complicated ordinance, uh, it, you should demand that that ordinance be very well written, be very understandable, and if years later it proves not to be, you should say to the city attorney, what happened here? And um, I really try to impress that on the attorneys in my office because the charter says this, that we draft ordinances and, and we need to take it very seriously. And it's not simple to do. Uh, there are a lot of considerations that go into drafting a good ordinance. And I, and I just want you know, to mention that and to tell you how seriously in the people, the attorneys in our office take that. Um, just moving to the next slide. One of the things we do in our office, that, and, and, um, and I don't know that every city has the same approach, is that we're very active in code enforcement. We have a deputy city attorney. You know, when I started with the office, there were only three attorneys. That was 1983. And very shortly thereafter, the city council went to the city attorney and said, we want to crank up code enforcement. And so we, hired, we added a fourth attorney position to do code enforcement, a deputy attorney position. We still have a deputy attorney position doing code enforcement in the city. And we actually now have the luxury, when we get into the details of what used to be called a law clerk, uh, it's not fair to call that individual law clerk anymore because for the last seven or eight years they've been lawyers admitted to practice in California, so we're now calling them a contract attorney. Unfortunately, we still have to pay them as if they were a law clerk. I think in, in fairness to them. They're happy to have the work, and we're happy to have them, but it's unfortunate that we can only pay them on a law clerk. Between the law clerk and the deputy city attorney, just the next couple of slides real quickly, this is uh, 1229 and 1231 Yananali Street. Uh, these are abandoned homes, uh, and I, I saw this. This referral came in from the code enforcement. You can see the junk in the yard, and then, of course, this, this home has holes right through the roof and right through the garage. And um, I just, again, you know, I saw this referral a few weeks ago come in, and they all come to me, and I said, you know, this is a top priority. No, neighbor, no neighborhood should have to put up with this sort of thing. It makes absolutely no sense. Occasionally, a lot we find that the, the, the property owner for, has medical reasons why they're not taking care of their property. That's not true in this case as far as I know, and, but no neighbor and no neighborhood should have to put up with this sort of thing. So this is, this is something that our deputy city attorney has been told is a top priority to get to. So just to the, yeah. Uh, again, I sort of talked about this, uh, you know, but again, as a full service city and uh, six full-time attorneys, one half-time former law clerk, now hourly contract attorney, uh, this is the, you know, the departments that we advise, and it keeps us pretty busy. Uh, yet, you know, and I don't need to go, you know better than anyone what's happened in the last few years. So in terms of salary and benefits from 2009 to 2014, projected 2014, we're actually down, and um, down 13.1%. Um, expenditure. So, Steve, yes. What did that reduction consist in? Primarily, uh, it was a um, we laid off one attorney. I think 2010, and uh, other than that, it was cutting back on hours for some of our clerical staff. Several positions have been cut back in terms of the hours, and uh, we we now have as many attorneys as we had in 2009, but they're uh, it's a deputy instead of an assistant position, and the law clerk is at halftime now. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. The, um, our supplies and services are down as well. That is primarily, and I mentioned this last year at this time, that we were able to renegotiate our lease in a, in a, very, in a market very favorable to tenants. 
with a landlord who I think wanted to keep us. And uh, so our, our rents are down and consequently our supplies and services are down. In terms of uh, why the, the salary and benefit numbers are going up, of course, that uh, reflects our the, the additional PERS costs, reflects the, the, the annual adjustment that's being proposed for salaries. And then uh, is it we calling it PERB or, or there's some OPED, yeah. The distribution of the uh, uh, unallocated liability, I guess uh, I can't think of the right term right now. The, the fact that we've all, every department has out there accrued sick time, accrued uh, vacation hours that was an unfunded liability and now we're going to start funding that liability, something of course makes, makes a lot of sense. Oh, you know, it, at least I should mention as well, back on that last slide, there are a couple of incre small increases that I uh, am suggesting in this budget. For example, uh, one of the things we had to cut that uh, it was uh, training an education budget for the attorneys. And I think that we cut that down to the bare minimum in 2009. I'm suggesting that this next year we add $5,000 to our budget and that would be for the six attorneys to attend primarily league seminars. Uh, you know, as attorneys, we're all required to uh, have continuing education, 22 hours every two years of continuing education in certain specific areas in particular. And uh, while you can get some of that online, you still have to pay for it, but you can get it online. And you can get some of it locally at, at, at meetings. You generally have to pay for that as well. I just think it's uh, the league is such a tremendous resource. The league city attorney section is such a tremendous resource. It would now, if the city can afford it, would be good to send some of our attorneys to these league meetings, league seminars, as well as there's others. Uh, per, uh, Liebert Cassidy has a great has great seminars on personnel law, and of course there's there's planning conferences and CEQA, CEQA conferences as well. Um, we are not just a department that, uh, well, let me, let me say first, of course, as I mentioned, we provide advice to a lot more than just general fund employees, general fund departments. So it makes sense that there's an overhead allocation, uh, just as you would do the sort of, that sort of thing for payroll or for HR services. There's an overhead allocation distributed to the non-general funds for our services. And... You know, uh, this has been studied uh, in detail by consultants over the years in terms of whether, what the correct allocation is. And this is, of course, the, the most currently, the current correct allocation. Uh, of course, we, we aren't just a department that uh, costs money. We do bring in some revenues. In years past, for years, of course, that was, it was appropriate to distribute some of the redevelopment agency tax increment to the city attorney's office to, to represent the fact that we advise the city the city redevelopment agency. Uh, we do bring in miscellaneous revenues. In fact, we had a good year in the past year. This is primarily civil penalties on code enforcement where under the municipal code, we have the right to demand uh, civil penalties for civil code enforcement. Actually, it can be as high as $1,000 a day. So in this past year, we've, we've brought in almost $71,000 in, as I say, civil penalties for the city. So that's, that's my last slide. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ms. Maria. Thank you, Mr. Wiley, for your presentation. What is the dollar figure of the training that you're talking about? Did I miss that? Or? I, uh, the increase, I think it's, uh, the increase that I asked for was $5,000. The, I think the budget's been down to about 1500 in, in recent years. Thank you. And I, that is included in the proposed budget. Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, when services were cut back by the loss of the attorney. The, the loss of the attorney was four years ago, something like that? Yeah, about that now, yeah. Well, what, three. How did, how did you change the, the operation to well, deal with that? You know, to be honest, there was, a, there was a period of time, about nine months, where we were down one attorney, and we just had to distribute that among the, the attorneys. So, uh, for example, we took the water division, and 
we transferred that responsibility to one attorney in the office, to Sarah Connect, and we took um, ultimately uh, just general public works advice, and we asked Taba Ostringer in our office to cover that. And then I picked up some of the slack. We all picked up some of the slack. And I will tell you, though, it, it wasn't easy. And, you know, this reminds me, uh, it, 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 there was a lot of extra work during that period of time. We also, uh, Michelle Montez was an attorney in our office for, well, I'd say close to 10 years, and she recently uh, wanted to, to not work for a while. And we, we had that vacancy. We left that vacancy for a while, again, to just kind of get through the tough budget times, and we distributed the workload. Uh, as the attorneys get more experience and more uh, familiar with the city, for example, Teva uh, has been with the office now six years, and so she can handle a lot more than she could have that first year, things like that. Mm -hmm. So th there's, uh, there's not a sense of some services that were uh, cut out to get there or that it's what's the sustainability of this of running this system right. with one less attorney no I, I would say nothing got cut out there was it, it took us a, more time to get to things at, at when we were shorthanded well, on that thought moving forward I know at the last um, joint meeting with the Planning Commission just the amount of work that the Community Development Department is going to need from your office on implementing ordinances for, for the general plan implementation stage. That seems more than usual, um, and I'm wondering if maybe not this year, but in the next, in the second year of the of the plan, do we need to think about increasing hours in your department? You know that that's a very good question, and and I guess I haven't dealt with it directly because it, w it didn't need to do that immediately. Uh, Scott Vincent's been with the office, I think, almost 15 years now, and he, of course, advises community development. He works with the planners on ordinances, and then I work a lot with the planners as well. So between the two of us, that's a lot of experience, and we can handle a lot of ordinances, and that's what we've been doing, for example, with the average unit density ordinance. And I've been handling the historic resources aspects, and Scott and I both worked on the uh, Measure E2, if you will, that we did about a month ago. But there are things coming down the pike uh, that that's uh, going to be difficult to do, and it will hold the city back time-wise. And I think we recognized that when we talked about uh, totally redoing the 57 Chevy, and I think both community development and Jim Armstrong and city attorney's office realized we're probably going to need a little outside help on that one. Yeah, that would be good to monitor in the next six months or something and maybe look to see in, in FY15, especially with the updated local coastal plan and the zoning ordinance. I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of detailed work that's going to be needed soon. And the last thing we want is to delay the implementation process of the plan. So, right. yeah. Uh, Mr. House? Uh, I appreciate that explanation as, as you look forward. Um, so... How does it work exactly for your recovery of costs for, say, efforts that are generated within the different departments? So does community development get billed by, by your department for that additional work? Or is it just part of what's built into the salaries and the expectation that within your, I mean, for the additional workload? Or if you needed to hire somebody from outside for, for some period of time, who, who pays for that, basically? Well, in the case of community development, it's a general fund department, it's just built in. It's. I mean, does it show up in their budget or their request for fa funds or allocation, or does it show up as part of your budget? Well, that, that's really a policy call. It, call. it could be in either one in, in the future if, if we needed some outside help. But generally, if it, in terms of the city attorney's office advising community development, that, you know, uh, that's just what we do. I see. Yeah. Okay, and then in terms of um, looking ahead, and this sort of goes outside the budget, but maybe not quite, because you're talking about training. Um, I'm going to ask about succession planning, and especially given the, the nature of you've got some really qualified staff that have been around for a while, and uh, were we to lose one or another of the higher you know, achievers there, it could be a world of hurt. So um, your position, Sarah's, whatever, I mean, how, how do you look forward to that, and how do you plan for that? 
Well, I, I have actually. The council has has asked about this in recent years, and it's certainly a very good question and a very good. It just it uh, whether you look at the nature of the baby boomers and their <clears throat> the age they're reaching or whatever you as an organization, public and private, have to think about succession planning. So, uh, personally, as a lawyer, I believe uh, I'm a strong believer in lawyers for the city being very familiar with litigation, for example, because, you know, we do our own tort defense in-house. And it's, it's actually a rare municipal lawyer that knows a, much about tort defense litigation. And so I always encourage the attorneys in our office to handle litigation. We get enough of it, actually, not always tort defense, but we'll get a CEQA lawsuit or Prop 218 lawsuit or, or some, you know, uh, challenge to... Uh, the federal telephone tax, and I've always distributed those among the attorneys in the office as a form of succession planning. And you need to be able to go to court and to under, and to understand civil procedure and and litigation process as an attorney. Um, but and also personally, when there's a major project that comes along, I do think in those terms of asking the attorneys in, in our office who you know wants to handle a major project who has the ability to handle it, the background knowledge. So um, I, I've definitely been thinking in Okay, taking, taking advantage of cross-training opportunities. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you very yeah. much. Ms. Muriel? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I thought of some more questions, so thank you for letting me ask again. So, Mr. Wiley, um, in terms of the gang injunction, so if Judge Stern orders it to go forward, your office would have to produce the order, right, the document itself. So, and have you budgeted for that if, in case that happens? No, again, that, that would be just the general sort of legal advice that we provide, you know, that it wouldn't impact, I could not see something like that, for example, impacting our budget or saying, we, well, we need to hire some specialists. In fact, we're not recreating the wheel when it comes to the gang injunction, as I'm going to mention tomorrow night. We've got examples from the city of Oakland of signed actual gang injunctions, current ones from Oakland, San Francisco, San Diego. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's no secret, and it's, this is actually a, a good legal practice. Lawyers build on the work of other lawyers and other judges. And so if we were to be asked by the judge to draft a gang injunction, we would start with examples that we have and build on those and adapt them to Santa Barbara and to our purposes. So that actually probably wouldn't take more than a couple of lawyers working an afternoon to do that. Well, I'm glad to hear that you are interested in adapting it to Santa Barbara because I think we are different from the city of Oakland. Oh, sure. So, sure. so if the order goes through and an enjoined defendant violates the injunction, would your office, what would your office do then? That would require some work, right? On your part? Well, not necessarily. You know, the, of course, the gang injunction effort is a team effort with the county district attorney's office. Okay. And, and uh, Joyce Dudley's been great about allocating resources to, as part of that team, Hillary Dozer, who is a, a senior deputy district attorney in her office, has been very much involved. Uh, whether he will do it in, in terms of answering your question, the concept has always been that the city attorney's office would focus primarily on the, the trial and asking the judge to grant an injunction. But once the injunction is granted, we'd kind of turn it over to the district attorney's office and to the police department because I, maybe I'll get into more of this tomorrow night. This is a process where it starts with the police department seeing one, that one of our defendants has violated the injunction, right. filing a report, and that report would go to the district attorney's office. Okay. so. I should pay attention to this during the police yeah, department. Well, you know, I think we should probably talk about this budget again. discussion or tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Yeah. But because the gang injunction is a civil instrument, your office, I think, would would be active, not the district attorney's office. N and not maybe once, we can talk about this yeah, more. Not tomorrow. once we've gotten the injunction, because the the process for enforcing the injunction is actually much more like the process that a prosecutor uses to prove up a, a criminal case, for example. You, you actually, you have to prove the violation by a clear and convincing standard, which is not a civil standard. That's more of a criminal standard. And it's more of the DA's office would have to prove to the judge that the injunction had been violated. 
Well, something to be discussed tomorrow night is that the defendant cannot use a public defender because it's in the right. civil arena. Right. So there's our a little mismatch here that the prosecution, so to speak, gets to use um, a, a criminal f foundation, but, you know, the defendant doesn't. Right. Our 30 defendants, I think about eight of them have attorneys now. Okay. And about 16 of them. The most of the ones that don't have attorneys are in prison. We, we should probably here. hold this till tomorrow night, unless there's a budget implication. As the city attorney, if he was sitting over there, I, might click I, on I, to say uh, keep within the budget. But unless there's a budgetary issue here, but I, I do I, have one. Thank you, sure, Madam Mayor. Ahead. So you brought up in your presentation these co code enforcement cases, and I remember asking Mr. Armstrong last year if the city attorney's office wasn't busy with the gang injunction, what would you be doing? And he and Mr. Casey were thinking, and they said, well, maybe more code enforcement. So do you agree with that, that no, that might I, be something I, I really that you would do? So. I, I think we would, if we weren't busy with this, it would be something else. For example, we, you know, we, we get sued, I don't know, two or three times a month by different people for accidents, for torts. We'd right. be handling that. You, you can't really control that. It's hard to say what we would be doing if we weren't doing what we were asked to be doing. Well, We'd be doing what of, else we yeah, were Yeah, I just asked. think there's plenty of code enforcement yeah. out there. I mean, these these pictures look familiar oh, well, but, to me. Yeah, I so, should make clear, yeah. John Doimus are, 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 and our law clerk, our deputy and our law, have nothing to do with the gang injunction effort. They're not, they're not cutting ah. any corners in code enforcement. They have... I don't even think they're aware that we're seeking a gang injunction. Well, I'm glad we're having this discussion in, in open session, so thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ms. You're welcome. Mr. Francisco. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wiley, I, on the, uh, the water boards on which I represent the city, we get a monthly bill from council, and those bills are usually uh, down to the minute. And I'm just curious if your office tracks your attorney's time in the same way. Uh, Councilmember Francisco, no, and we, we've never done that sort of thing. Um, I, I got to tell you, when, when we have attorneys come work for us, sometimes from private practice, they go, wow, I'm totally glad not to have to track. <laughs> the last I saw was attorneys to track themselves. And they've got, of course, machines and computers now that do, have, do all of this. They'll track it down to the six-minute increments. Uh, we've never had to do that with the one exception that we, and this has been very old style, we keep track the, of our redevelopment hours. And that was primarily, in my time, Sarah Connect advising the redevelopment agency. And then I would keep track of the hours every month, just on a monthly basis, on a piece of paper, the number of hours we spent, because that is a direct billing at an hourly rate for, was for the redevelopment agency. Mm -hmm. yeah. is the, do you think that that's a standard practice for municipal offices? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for, for salaried in-house attorney offices. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. Thank Madam you Mayor, much. I, I yes. just wanted to clarify one thing, um, and that is on the, on the zoning ordinance um, update that we have in the capital budget, we have included, I think, $60,000 for extra legal expenses that we expect to incur. How we spend that money at this point, we haven't decided if it would be you know, bringing an additional attorney on or contracting it out, but we have, because that's such an extra workload effort, we built that in the budget. Okay. Mr. House. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, thank you. That's kind of what I was asking, too, before. Are there any other examples of that, or is that, besides, this, besides say, the uh, enterprise funds, that, that would be the only example you can think of where we're actually setting aside additional funds for anticipated um, workload? Yeah, that's correct, at least for, for in, in the legal arena. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to the airport. Ms. Ramsdale. And Great. Good afternoon. Um, Assistant Airport Director uh, Hazel Johns and Airport Operations Manager Tracy Lincoln will be uh, participating with me in the budget presentation uh, this afternoon. As the Tri-County's airport of choice, or at least we like to think that it is, um, our mission is that the airport will be self-sustaining, exceed uh, expectations for safety and quality of service, and meet the air transportation and economic development needs of its customers and partners. As an enterprise fund, uh, we are, the airport department is financially self-sustaining. 
Uh, our revenues are from user rents and, and or excuse me, user fees and tenant rents, uh, and no local tax dollars are used. However, federal law does require that the airport's revenues uh, be spent on airport operations, maintenance, and capital improvement. The airport department is comprised of 11 programs and has 52 employees that carry out the business, security, operations, maintenance, and planning, and facility development work of the programs. About 82% of the department's employees work in the security, operations, and maintenance uh, programs. After many years of planning and construction of the new uh, airline terminal, uh, we now have almost, if you can believe it, two years worth of um, operating experience. Uh, we were able to anticipate many of the workload impacts to our staff um, during the design of the terminal. Uh, however, uh, there were uh, some impacts that were of a greater magnitude than anticipated, and some were created by changes um, in security regulations and operations through the uh, Transportation Security Administration. While almost all of the department programs were affected in some way, uh, the security program was affected the most, and specifically the uh, Security Operations Center, which operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The center is kind of like our communications hub with our uh, security staff, um, maintenance staff performing dispatching responsibilities, communicating with the FAA tower, as well as local agencies' uh, dispatch centers. They also perform um, security badging uh, that is required for uh, numerous people and employees on the airport. Our organization has uh, many strengths, but I'd say our professional staff, uh, we have broad areas of responsibility ranging from property management to security to uh, our stewardship, environmental stewardship of the SLU. So it's um, quite broad, and the, also one of our um, strengths is that we're financially sound. However, our constraints are also um, maybe of equal weight as to the strengths. We're in a highly regulated environment, um, both environmentally as well as through security and operationally through the uh, FAA. Um, many unanticipated mandates come down, particularly through recent, in recent years through the Transportation Security Administration, and many of these have short um, compliance deadlines. The department employees have worked diligent, diligently to try and uh, meet all of these added uh, workload responsibilities, but at some point the effectiveness has um, become diminished. We held a department uh, program owner workshop uh, last fall and talked about kind of the gaps and challenges um, in our department workload. And to a person in the room, we all agreed that our security program really um, warranted the focus and priority for any um, staffing changes uh, or increases so that we could address the gaps in that service. Uh, some of the examples of uh, the Transportation Security Administration uh, regulations and operational changes uh, that were required, some related to the new terminal and some not related to the new terminal. Uh, for instance, all vendors and concessionaires who were not uh, badged to be in the most sensitive secure areas of the terminal have to be escorted. In the old terminal, we didn't have vendors coming into the secure areas because we didn't have concessions in the, the uh, secure area. Well, dozens of times a day, our security operations center is called by vendors, concessionaires for these escort services. They have to, you know, by radio, get the escort provided and then uh, log and document um, all these services that are provided. It's required. So that has increased substantially since we've been in the new terminal. Another operational requirement that the um, TSA has required is that vehicles um, requiring access to the terminal ramp, before we used to use technology, you had your security badge, and through technology you could gain access to the ramp, and 
if he didn't have the proper access, an alarm would go off and we would know that somebody, you know, that wasn't authorized was on the ramp. Well, the, the operational change that the TSA is now requiring is that the driver's employer has to, on a daily basis, if they know their driver's going on the terminal ramp, um, get their uh, employee verified through the Security Operations Center, uh, as well as when the employee actually accesses the ramp, they personally have to also contact and be verified by the Operations Center. And this requires not only vetting of that employee at the time, but then following up logging and, and documentation. So it's, this happened, I thought, how many vehicles could go on the, the uh, terminal ramp a day? A couple dozen? Well, it turns out about 160 vehicles a day. Uh, you have fuel trucks, uh, you have the airlines have their lav carts that they run back and forth across the field. Uh, we have our maintenance employees, you have vendors and, and so forth. So it's actually turned out to be quite a bigger number than um, any of us actually thought. Uh, the last example I'll give you is that the TSA um, originally, after 9-11, only required airline terminal employees that needed access to secure areas of the terminal to be badged. Well, in the last few years, they've expanded that to any aviation business or aircraft based aircraft owner that needs access to the field has to be badged. Our badging went from 400 to 1,500. So all of this kind of added on to each other in terms of workload for the Security Operations Center, and we just felt that at this point, we just could not operate like this um, into the future, and we needed to add positions, which we don't do lightly. Um, so we, as a result of the um, workshop that we had, we looked at what the staffing requirements would be in terms of additional uh, employees and have proposed to add staff to the Security Operations Center and for the, the badging office. And this will allow our staff to most, more adequately meet the um, new workload or additional workload that they've been experiencing. Uh, also, by adding more staff to the Security Operations Center, we'll be able to get them out into the field doing airfield inspections several times a day. Uh, right now, airport patrol does that, and you really don't need a gun and a badge to do the, those types of inspections, but you just need someone that knows what they're looking for. Um, so this will help relieve airport patrol of some of those responsibilities and enable them to focus on the airline terminal and other areas where you do need the uh, qualifications that they, they possess. On the next slide, I will show you what the, the proposed uh, additional positions are. The cost of this, um, these proposed positions for fiscal year 2014 is about $270,000. For fiscal year 2015, is about $298,000. We have a question, Mr. Francisco. Mrs. Ramstall, do the, um, do the additional security requirements that the TSA has asked for, do they make sense? <laughs> um, in some regards, you know, maybe to the to those of us common folk, uh, they seem like they don't, or not that they don't make sense, but it it seems a lot for a small airport. However, when you think that some of the most tragic events started at a small airport for 9/11, um, uh, all of those people gained access to the aircraft through small airports, not big airports. So, when you look at the big picture. Um, you know, I guess uh, you'd have to say that it does make sense in terms of the safety of the whole nation. But for a small airport, sometimes it does seem, you know, excessive. I don't know if Tracy has okay. anything to add. I tried to dance around that without totally. <laughs> um. uh, Mrs. Ramsdale, the, um, the, the question that comes to mind just in, in, um, in, the, in the context of what uh, Mr. Francisco is saying is, we are the portal through which people pass to become inside the perimeter of the entire airspace system when they board here in Santa Barbara. And this is a pretty significant additional cost. And I, um, I noticed that you didn't mention the balancing, um, you know, mandated cost reimbursement. 
<laughs> from the federal system of some sort. And um, am I correct in, in, in surmising that there just isn't one? I mean, are we able to achieve uh, additional funding to support this effort that's on behalf of the entire national airspace system? It is not a mandate that has been that is funded by the federal government. We do receive a reimbursement for them. We also have to staff the exit lane as passengers get off the airplane and go, you know, out this out of the secure area. We staff that 20 hours a day, Tracy. Yes. About 20 hours a day when we use uh, hourly employees to do that, and we are um, reimbursed, you know, a certain amount for for that, but. That funding is decreasing, and I wouldn't be surprised within the next few years to see that go away as well. Okay, so it is a burden then that our local airport has to find some way to bear, right. and that's why you're proposing it in the budget without an offsetting reimbursement. Correct. Thank you. That is correct. Okay. Um, Okay. The Security Operations Center and our badging office employees are co currently assigned to the security program, which has a total of uh, 17 employees and one supervisor. With the addition of more Operations Center staff, uh, we're proposing that we assign the um, eight and a half positions that will be for the Operations Specialist uh, staff to at the airport operations program under the supervision of an operations supervisor. And that will provide better supervision for um, both the staff in the security program as well as in the operations program. And that will leave 12 employees in the um, security program. Currently, the um, operations center has four uh, operations specialist uh, positions, and we're proposing to add one operations specialist, two senior operations specialists who will be kind of the lead uh, person on the various uh, shifts that are um, staffed, as well as one administrative specialist to be assigned to the badging office. Uh, we are proposing to adjust um, several positions. One is to reclass the airport patrol supervisor for the um, increased regulations and uh, responsibilities that that position has had to undertake over the years that um, hasn't been addressed you know, with uh, the ad addition of uh, security regulations and, and workload in, his, uh, in, in that position. We currently have a vacant airport noise operations specialist position. We uh, propose to eliminate that position and then create a position called uh, operations supervisor. So it will be a slightly um, additional cost, but it will be kind of trading one position for another. The other is to um, eliminate an accounting assistant and add an administrative analyst position, and this would be in our um, business and properties program to help with uh, financial planning, uh, research and analysis, kind of higher level uh, work than the accounting assistant uh, position was doing previously. And then finally, to reduce one airport operations specialist position to 50 percent, and this relates to the, the incumbent's um, personal situation that we're accommodating. So the operations specialist position that we're adding is so that we get one full-time person back in the SOC, and the uh, reduced hours position will be um, in the badging office with the administrative special. There are a lot of specialists, I realize, in these job titles. Um, so that, with those adjustments, we think that we will be able to um, better accommodate the uh, workload that we have and responsibilities and have everybody be properly uh, supervised. So now Hazel will um, move on to the Pauline. budget. And Pauline. Yes. Okay. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Could you go back to the previous slide for a moment? Sure. Thank you. Could you say a little bit about what operations specialists and administrative specialists and supervising specialists do? <laughs> they, they specialize. Uh, no, Tracy, could you please? The airport operations specialists are the ones that actually work in the security operations center. They answer all the incoming calls. They monitor all the alarms. They 
in input data as needed so people can get access to the areas they need and they also issue notices to airmen and they're trained in airfield inspections and that's the part we're looking to increase that part of their workload and their that responsibilities the administrative specialist will function as a, a credentialing officer they check all of the IDs they upload all of the information to the TSA secure website they get the results um, that type of thing and, and there's a lot of it the airport operations supervisor not a specialist but just the operations supervisor is the new position and it will oversee all of the security operations center it'll monitor all of the maintenance contracts we have with the CCTV system the access control system the emergency notification system and the associated badging systems do all the scheduling help training and emergency preparedness as well and is there one more I miss uh, the other the other thing I'm curious about is the difference between an airport operations specialist and a senior airport operations specialist. the senior just has a, a greater level of experience and knowledge and they will act as a lead person on shift the the hope here is that we have the seniors on evenings and weekends, so we mm -hmm. always have some supervision there, and then the supervisor will be there at other times. So their duties are the same, it's just that they're operating in, in more of a leadership role? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I, what I'd point out is that this is a 24 hour a day operation, seven days a week, and so you have the supervisor who supervises the overall function, but obviously they can't be there all the time. And so basically, you have shifts, and the senior person is kind of the person in charge on each shift. And it's similar to what we do, for example, in the police dispatch operation, where we also have a 24-hour day operation. Okay, thank you. Okay, the goal of the budget was to incorporate the reorganization plan as well as the other department program needs for the next two years. In doing so, we relied upon the 18 months experience operating in the new terminal, allowing us to make good cost projections on our expenses. We also identified any associated costs for the reorganization. The airport has a total of seven separate funds, five of which have separate revenue streams, all of which are segregated because of federal or state funding requirements. This slide reflects page H18 in your budget um, and consolidates all of the revenues and expenditures for the whole department. At the top of the slide, the funds generating revenue are highlighted. Just briefly, the FAA entitlement grants, as you know, are those that we receive for capital projects at the airport. And the, the funding level is targeted to a formula set by the total number of in-plane passengers. The passenger facility charge is a fee included when airline tickets are purchased. The fees from the current application are dedicated to 49% of the debt service on the new airline terminal project. Customer facility charge is a flat $10 fee on every rental car contract. Uh, and the revenues from this fee is used to pay the debt on the quick turn facility, uh, which we constructed in the last four years for the rental car companies, all of the on-airport rental car companies to maintain their vehicles and also store extra vehicles. The airport constructed 24 T-hangers, you'll recall, about four years ago. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in doing that, we acquired a loan from Caltrans, Department of Aviation, uh, for the cost of the hangers. Uh, rental from the T-hangers repays that loan. And last, the airport operating fund receives revenues from user fees and tenant rents for airport buildings and land. At the bottom, I'd like to call your attention to the capital program. Um, as you know, capital projects are budgeted in full for the whole cost, but if they have a revenue reimbursement, the revenue lags because you have to spend the money first and then get reimbursed. So that's why you'll see a negative at the bottom. From the consolidated budget, Removing the other funds, this slide represents the airport's operating fund budget for 2014 and 15. Revenues are still consolidated, but in the next slide, I'll break those down. Salaries and benefits for 2014 incorporate the reorganization, and all positions are fully funded without the furlough deduction from previous years. Supplies and services line item includes allocated cost as well as materials, supplies, utilities, and contracts. This chart, <coughs> excuse me, breaks down the consolidated totals 
and focuses on the airport's revenues or lines of business. Revenues from the airlines, commercial aviation leases, continue to increase as a percentage of the whole at 24%. Rates and charges for the airlines when they use our building space in the terminal and the landing fees are negotiated on an annual basis and those rates are presented to City Council for approval and then implemented July 1st. While commercial industrial leases increase marginally on an annual basis, approximately 3%, as a percentage of the total budget, this segment has decreased over the years while our aviation leases have increased, which is a goal that we set several years back. The largest share of the revenue pie at 35.5% is terminal lease revenue. This includes parking, and as you know, all three of our parking lots are open and operational, rental car, food and beverage, gift shop, and other concessions. The general aviation leases, non-commercial aviation, have also increased in the last couple of years due to new lease agreements and landing fees. So the total projected revenues for the department $15.7 million. <clears throat> Thank Simmel. you, Madam Mayor. Quick question, Ms. Jones. Uh -huh. so, so the parking revenues are then um, included in the terminal lease, the 33.5%, and is that, is, that, is, it, is that contracted out? Is that, an oper is that a, a subcontractor that, that, uh, or a vendor, I should say, that runs parking? We have, um, it's a management contract is what we have. Okay. So they provide the staffing and the operational uh, expenses. We reimburse that on a direct cost basis, um, and then they charge a modest fee to handle it. But all of the revenues are, are collected and deposited in the city's bank. And then so the personnel required to run parking are not part of your headcount as far as your... Land. That's correct. And it's then the second question was on the uh, uh, landing fees, uh, the things that we, we approve and charge. How do we compare to surround, I mean, it's kind of hard in this area regionally, but compared to places like Santa Maria, San Luis Obispo? Um, airports, actually, you don't measure because every airport, their finances are different. Uh, Santa Maria, as you know, is a district, so they have property, they have revenue coming in that we don't have. Hmm. Um, so they actually look at cost per in-plane passenger. That's a normal way of airports with commercial service, anyway, uh, comparing with other airports. In Santa Barbara this year, our goal was around $9.75 per in-plane passenger, and we're very close to that. We might be, as you can imagine, the costs are flat, and it goes up and down with the number of passengers. And in the last 10 months, as you know, we've been increasing the number of passengers at the terminal. So ours is closer to $10 than $9.75, but that's still very um, – Reasonable. We have not had any airline complain. Well, that was the lead of my that. question was or any pushbacks from airlines that would make a decision whether or not to serve Santa Barbara based on those kind of criteria. No, and we just had a meeting uh, last week, May 8th, with uh, representatives from all of the airlines, with the exception of United. Um, and quite frankly, the only um, question that they really grilled us on was the airports uh, or the city's mandated uh, reserve funds in funding those. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss, go ahead. Thank you. In fact, we compare quite well with the, all our competition, do we not, and the uh, cost that you were talking about? We certainly do. We're uh, right in line with all that. Could you explain to me the difference between aviation and commercial leases? I'm assuming that aviation is general aviation, anything right on in the airport and the commercial is off site, is that right? Karen, I should say Karen hates these titles. <laughs> commercial aviation is the airlines. And when they rent space at the airline terminal and also pay landing fees. Non-commercial aviation, that's like the fixed space operators on the field, anybody inside the air operations area. Um, the FBOs, um, Stratman is another tenant, Ampersand is a tenant, that's the revenue that goes to that. But I'm talking about commercial industrial lease. A commercial industrial leases, that's everything that we lease for non-aviation purposes. Even not including on the, right around the airport itself as yes, well sir. as off-site. Thank if, you. And off-site, I'm assuming you mean north of Hollister. Yes, north of Hollister and some 
um, a little bit south of Hollister. We have some buildings uh, there that are also leased on a short-term basis. Okay. Uh, our expenditures for um, 2014 are also approximately $15.7 million. And this pie chart breaks down the budget into categories for salaries and benefits, which are 35 percent uh, of our total uh, supplies and services. This one includes the intra-department uh, agreements that we have with the fire department for ARF. Uh, it also includes the public works department agreement for two engineers at the airport, um, and that's 37 percent of our total. Allocated costs are 9 percent. Uh, debt service um, is 11.6 percent, and this is 51 percent of the total debt service requirement for the terminal bonds, uh, which is uh, generated through our operational uh, revenues. The parking shuttle um, cost is $863,000. It's expensive. Equipment for the budget doesn't show up because it's only $52,000, so it didn't warrant a, a slice. <laughs> Um, the last slide, uh, speaking of airport uh, policy reserves, uh, July 1st, as you know, at the end of the year, they always um, adjust these based on budget. And this is our reserves as of July 1st of this year. As you can see, they're all fully uh, funded, and we did have um, almost a million dollars available for uh, non-specified reserves. <laughs> Tracy Lincoln now will do the key. Can, what what would that be? What would be a reason to have reserves above policy? I guess just to go back to that previous question that you had with the capital um, mm -hmm. for capital needs. Mm -hmm. And do we have it? We do it. So we don't have anything. But so you're saving up for a future capital need. There's nothing in next year's budget that would require the use of those. We reserves. plan to. Um, we've been catching up on some of our capital expenditures. Uh, in the last year and a half, and so at this point, that'll fall to our bottom line. And then, as we program capital expenditures, those monies will come out of reserve, be appropriated by council at the time the project's awarded. So uh, that's what they will be used for. We can't make a profit, so as Karen said earlier, everything has to be used on the airport. No, I, I understand that. I was just wondering, with nine hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars, is there an anticipated cost coming up that you're going to use those funds, you, or are you just saving up until, if and when you do have that most cost? of the at least five hundred thousand dollars of that would be used for our routine, ordinary expenses to take care of the the buildings, the structures, uh, our water system, sewer system, roads and streets. So we would appropriate some funds for that. So why, then why isn't that just in the expense line of the budget as opposed to being in a reserve fund? Because we needed to this, some of these funds were used to, to balance out some of the overages that we had in the prior year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Lincoln. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, briefly highlight the key performance objectives for the coming year. In administration, we will... Uh, the performance objective, the main one that I think you'll be most interested in is the to implement the reorganization that we just described to you, which is advertise, hire, train, develop the job standards. So we'll be working diligently on that throughout the year. Uh, regarding business and properties, they will be developing a request for proposal for a fixed-based operator. I, I think most everybody knows the fixed-based operators provide all the fueling services on the airport for both airlines and general aviation, and they provide all of the general aviation customer services. So we have two world-class fixed-based operators on our airport. And, and it is a requirement that you out with a request for proposal every so many years from the, from the FAA. Regarding the marketing and communications, we will be increasing the awareness of uh, Santa Barbara Airport in the Ventura County through a strategic marketing program. Uh, there is approximately 1.7 million passengers in that area that need to know they have an opportunity to fly out of our airport. So we are uh, heading into the south to get some additional exposure. Regarding the security program, we will develop an active shooter response plan for use in the event of an incident at the uh, airline terminal. We, it's, it's important, and I know that uh, the TSA likes to see these things developed, and they've already asked about it. So we'll be working on that in the security program. Certain ops, we will be conducting another full-scale emergency exercise in fall. 
So you'll, you can expect invitations to come watch and it will be a full scale drill where all the first responders are part of it. We do one every three years and they are required by the FAA. And then in facilities planning and development, they will be issuing the have received comments on a scoping document for the airport master plan environmental analysis and they'll have that by June 14. I think everybody knows we are in the midst of a master plan process right now and the environmental is the kind of the next step in that process once you get through the program and you have some what appears to be preferred alternatives they'll do a programmatic environmental on those. And and that's uh, and that's the end of the presentation if there's Thank any you. questions I'd be happy. Questions to. from the council Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is now the right time to talk about some of the specifics of the marketing that you plan? Or should it be done later? I'll leave that to Karen. The marketing? Yes. Um, no, we can talk about it now. Uh, what, what a, uh, we did a study several years ago that identifies kind of what our market area is and where passengers, um, either from our central market area, go down to LA airports, which I won't mention their names. Um, but also what it did is identify um, the Ventura County as a, a um, kind of a tertiary market for us that we really don't tap into in terms of marketing. Um, here locally we do the bus boards. Uh, we are starting to do those in the Ventura area as well. Um, also making contacts with their travel agents and chambers to um, just acquaint them with um, you know, what we have to offer at the Santa Barbara Airport. Currently, the Oxnard Airport has um, no commercial service, so um, we feel like, you know, this is a good opportunity to um, get our, keep our passenger base um, increasing and... Is it too early to see if that can be measured yet, the effectiveness of that? It's too early at this point because we've just started with the, the uh, bus advertising down there. Um, we just started with some of the other um, marketing activities. So hopefully in the next six months or so we can kind of see, um, you know, by doing surveys and stuff where passengers are, are coming from. Any other new thrusts expected? I'm sorry? Any other new areas or thrusts expected and more internet, whatever? I don't know. I'm just fishing here. I can't think of anything other than that. Um, that's a, a pretty big uh, marketing effort in terms and population down there too. And, and we but said we had, you had a budget of 1.2 million. Is that what we said? No. No, I said there's 1.7 million people in that area. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. House. Um, just in that same uh, lines. Um, I think some people locally have, for the service that's available in Burbank, often they'll take the train down to Burbank because it's very convenient that way and they miss the LAX experience and that's just fine. Um, but it just makes me wonder if we, we have shuttles going over to the long-term parking facility and the train station's right there. Have we ever done anything to, to coordinate at all with, um, that, with rail service and really think about that they could just as well come to Santa Barbara on the trains as opposed to go the other way? I mean, I don't think Not we've ever with, talked about it like much. With the trains, um, a lot of the cabs, of course, see the opportunity to transport you know people from the train station to the airport. And we do get some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but and it's, it's become it's become almost like a there's a little subculture of people that use Burbank here in Santa Barbara and bypass our you know, but they're taking all that time to get down there in the train, and it's, it, it's the same benefits could apply going the other way without parking. I mean, just something to think about. Um, you're coordinating uh, and been with the Conference of Visitors, Visitors Bureau on our marketing efforts, and um, I get to see you over there. It's wonderful. And um, how effective is our coordination with the Conference and Visitors Bureau in generating um, ridership or um, flyership um, out of our airport passenger count? It's it's very good. Um, when they go to their various um, I guess they call them trade shows. They also promote uh, our airport. Their marketing materials promote the airport. Uh, and we're in very close contact with them in terms of markets that we feel that um, are important to the airport in terms of, you know, Santa Barbara service to that community or vice versa. And they incorporate those uh, comments into their marketing plans when they uh, go to these various um, conferences and uh, market shows. Do you have anything to add? 
we also work, as you know, we have seasonal service with Alaska to Portland. And that service, last year we had it just for June, July, and, and um, August. This year it's extended through September. And working with the Conference Investors Bureau, they tend to advertise in Portland uh, to generate traffic to Santa Barbara. We generate Santa Barbara going to Portland. So it's a really good, close working relationship. Um, and one other thing that we're looking forward to doing um, in the new fiscal year is a visitor center at the airline terminal, something Karen's been wanting for a long time. And we're working with the Conference and Visitors Bureau, Downtown Chamber of Commerce, as well as Goleta Chamber of Commerce to put that project together. And that'll come back to City Council once we have it all together. Okay, I've got a couple, a couple more things here. Um, and in terms of new services, I mean, uh, there's when we do add a new um, destination or like Portland's a good example um, and Alaska same thing so what what are we what are we doing right now to actively encourage more um, airline service out of out of here we lost some during the recession how are we how are we doing on getting it back well, as you know we have an airline service consultant that we've worked with for probably the last 30 years or not the same one but we've had one for the last 30 years and we constantly are uh, keeping in contact with the carriers that we have here to preserve the service we do have. Also to convince them to try and bring back service we may have lost, as well as looking at other carriers for service either that we lost or service we've never had that we would like. Um, Hazel and the um, consultant have gone to two air service conferences recently and they do what they call kind of like speed dating and you get a certain amount of very short period of time with an airline and we were requested by quite a few airlines this time um, and we make our uh, economic pitch to them how mm -hmm. they can make a profit here and uh, succeed so okay because many, many of their reasons for leaving weren't like because of our bad service or something it was even the ridership would be up but they had use of the jets right. for some other place um, and, and the last uh, deal here I well actually I need to have some kind of a uh, a pulse kind of number or something that I can report to the downtown organization or you know you can but we they ask for how's our economy doing and the airport is really one of those indicators in terms of I think employments or ridership or something what would I what would be the best thing to report Go ahead. I think <laughs> that reporting that in the last 10 months it seems like we've turned the tide and we've had increases each month uh, except for February because we lost a day in February this year, but each month uh, for the last 10 months in, riders, in passenger traffic. So we're up overall fiscal year to date about 2%, uh, which is very good. Um, the airlines are, um, we've had changes in equipment. You know, Frontier brought in the A319, which is a full-size jet flying to Denver. It does have first-class service. Um, American also changed their equipment from the smaller uh, jets to larger. So we're seeing a shift in that regard. Um, we're working with United to try to add another flight to Denver during the summer as they did last year. So it's, as Karen said, it's ongoing all the time. I mean, and the airlines make decisions on a quarterly basis. They don't do long-term planning anymore. I mean, it, it literally is month to month and, and maybe three months in a row. But uh, so we're working with that. Um, and there's unique airline opportunities that come up. Uh, small regional carriers who do startups, and, and we may see some of that in, in the new, near future. Okay, good. And my comment on the security issues. Um, the way I look at it, and I, by the way, appreciate what you're doing and why you're putting a great focus on that, even in, in spite of the fact there's not additional funding for it. But I would look at it, if there were to have been some terrible thing occur here, what would we do in response? And the fact that you're doing this in a proactive way and you're not, I mean, you're responding to the requirements, of course, but I have a sense that there's a spirit of really trying to do it well the, and within the budget. The idea of using the non um, badged, you know, officers or people that can do the other work to free them up. I think those are the kinds of efficiencies that are really, uh, really deeply appreciated by us. But I, I want to say thank you very much for putting security up front on this. Mr. Francisco. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so you're starting this marketing program in Ventura. Could you give us some examples of, for someone in Ventura, what would be faster or cheaper or both 
in driving north instead of driving south? Well, right now we do have people that do come from Ventura and Thousand Oaks that use our airport. We just want more of them. Um, but when you get to kind of the halfway point um, geographically, you know, if it makes sense to come up here, sometimes our, our fares are very competitive, and they just don't know that. Um, even people that live here don't know that because they assume that our, all of our fares are more expensive. Um, the drive is easier. Security is easier. Um, I would say parking is easier. Parking's cheaper. Um, so there, I think there are a lot of benefits, especially for those people that are geographically located kind of in the midway point between LA and Santa Barbara. So the, so the ads that you're doing, do they give examples? Uh, I don't know if we've done ad, we do, uh, so far we've just done the bus boards that are similar to the bus boards that we have here. Uh, and we're working with their chambers to try and figure out how to get the word out to their community. Um, so we're just starting to build those relationships. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. In amplification to Mr. House's questions, when it's not when we're trying to attract new flights here, it's not just us that has to be attractive, but the, the departure airport also has to be cheap. That is or reasonably expended so or spend cost effective. So I think Sacramento is like twenty bucks or something and, and uh, San Jose, which would be a great flight, is also very expensive, am I correct? So their operate their cost per in-plane passengers are uh, probably twice uh, San Jose is probably twice what we are and I'm not exactly sure about Sacramento. It could be closer to three times what we are. All right, so that's that's the challenge we have. Not only we're wonderful and reasonable but they got to take into account what the uh, departure airport costs. That's correct. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Maria? Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. I have a question related that's in the budget book on page H is in hotel 36. Um, related to airport security, it, the projected fiscal year 2013 column says that, and this is the item, complete all of the daily schedule checks of aircraft operations area patrol points 85% of the time. Do you see where it says it goes from 85% to 39.7? So for whatever reason you think you're not going to check all the patrol points, is, is that, am I reading that right? I will try a stab at this. Um, the uh, airport patrol has set up their own standards the different locations that they want to patrol. It's not that the, F the FAA or TSA requires each of these patrol points. But what this indicates is um, staffing issues in terms of um, after 9-11 we added airport patrol officers and I don't think for, I don't know, maybe six months during that whole time have we been fully staffed and been able to keep a full staff complement of airport patrol officers. Some of it had to do with pay which we uh, addressed. Some of it has to do with candidates who can't um, pass the background check, which is, you know, more than your average city employee like myself. Well, I have to pass it too. Um, average city employee has to, to pass. It's more rigorous. Um, other items that were it's a performance measure, and they can't successfully note that they've completed that performance measure until every single checkpoint on their, that particular inspection is done. So if they fall one short, if there's 15 of them and they've checked 14 and they get called away because they have to go respond, it's failure. They didn't finish the whole thing. That's why when you see it go from 85 to 39, they're projecting what we'll have at the end of the year because there's just not we're not going to make up ones that are missed already. That's the reason for the reduction in that stat. But uh, we hope to get called away less often if we have some additional assistance by the non-badge people taking care of some things. Thank you. So going back to um, trying to find, get back to San Jose or Sacramento, and I know there's a constant um, work on your part in working with your consultant and the airlines. I think it was today in the LA Times there was an article about the number of flights um, being reduced and Burbank actually getting harder hit than us, although we still got hit and having to do with the type of aircraft being used. And So I'm wondering with 
budgeting in the future or if there's a way to create more incentives or something that may have a cost up front for our for the department but in the long run as an um, you know waive the in plain fee for a you know the first year and but you have to require a three year commitment to San Jose or something like that um, or Sacramento actually we already have that program okay um, so we're doing every, so what so what so and how's that it, there's just not a response to it yet it's just not oh we've had um her, was it horizon to, horizon to sacramento. sacramento we uh used that program and then when the year was up they were gone <laughs> right so and that's kind of the issue with a lot of these incentive programs if, the, if it's a monetary incentive like paying the airline it that has to come from the community whether it's a chamber or a you know separate organization that's formed to do that. We, the airport itself can't do that in favoring one uh, airline over over another. But um, yeah, it, it, oftentimes when incentives are given, once the time period is run out, then the airline just leaves. So that's kind of been our um, hesitation. Even though we do have this program, when we do offer it. Uh, is that if an airline thinks they can't make it in a community, it does more harm for them to come and go mm -hmm. than it does not to have come at all, really. Okay. Well, thanks for that enlightenment. Um, I know you're constantly trying to find the, that sweet spot there. So a couple of things, um, just general uh, comments I get off and on about the airport and just to clear things up. One about the baggage claim. Uh, similar to parking, which you contract out, it's not city employees. Baggage claims not uh, pr conducted, whatever, you know, the bags aren't being moved around by city staff at all. Is that right? It's through the airlines. Right. So there, I've, I've heard a few negative comments about how long it takes to get your bag if you've checked a bag. And it's nothing to do that we don't have the moving, um, the, the moving, no. Conveyor belts, thank you, um, because it all just depends on when someone actually gets the bags off the plane and onto the cart and moved it over to baggage claim. Any way we have any leverage with, you know, increasing that customer service? Because, I mean, waiting 20 minutes, half an hour or something for your bag is very frustrating. We've spoken both to the local manager as well as the corporate representatives for the airlines. And currently, uh, one airline ground handles all the airlines at our airport. And um, they've had some staffing issues, and when that delayed bag uh, situation occurs, it's usually that they are have staffing issues. They don't have enough staff, so what they do is wait, you know, for a couple of flights that come in about the same time, and load them all at the same time, which makes the passengers who got off the first plane waiting even longer. Um, there are some changes that a couple of the airlines are going to make in terms of ground handling, and um, hopefully it'll happen in the next couple of months, right? Um, so hopefully we'll see some improvement in, in the service, but usually it's because they don't have enough staff at the time. Well, I don't know what kind of encouragement, pressure, whatever, either um, the general public in, in contacting customer service with that airline or what, however, but um, I know we're the ones that get blamed for it when exactly. I just wanted to put out there it's not, we don't have control over that, we'll, we need to hopefully change that. The other one that I hear again, and I, I know you know it's coming, it's about uh, the restaurant. Um, could you first uh, describe the level of sales in the new terminal versus the restaurant that was pre-security in the old terminal and how well it's doing? or not well, or whatever. Well, I think the uh, restaurant that is post-security, um, which is a full-service restaurant, plus coffee, bean, and tea leaf, their sales went up 30 or 40% when they went behind, or post-security. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that the passenger count didn't grow. In fact, our passenger count was going down, was that their customers, which are the passengers, were, many of them were leery of getting stuck in the coffee shop outside of security and then have to go through security and making their flight on time. So once you provided a place for them to relax, eat, post-security, um, sales just shot up. The gift shop did the same thing with sales. The um, coffee, bean, and tea leaf pre-security, their sales are about the same as they were um, pre at the uh, grab-and-go uh, 
little facility that we had in the old terminal. Okay. And you can still order from the restaurant post security at the coffee bean and tea leaf free right. security, anything on their menu. Right. And they'll bring it right down to And you. so I don't know if there's a signage issue or something. People just generally don't know that however many times I try to. So maybe there's some marketing inside the terminal about that opportunity. And I'm, I'm wondering even with the opening of the historic terminal, that could be an area I mean, not as a restaurant inside with all the all the kitchen, but maybe as a place with seating or dining or, you know, something where people do feel like if planes delayed, you know, if there's a cloud over San Francisco, things tend to happen in San Francisco. And so if people are waiting for someone to come in to have a comfortable place to sit and have a meal that um, – but that is still a constant – uh, feedback since the terminals opened and there are opportunities here. I'm just hoping maybe we can finally address those in a way that resonates with folks. We can, uh, but I, I think the bottom line is is that we really don't have enough customers for two full service restaurants. And I did, when these first complaints first started happening right after um, the opening of the terminal, I did a survey, kind of the LA Basin airports, I mean not just Tri-Counties, and there are very, very few airports that have full-service restaurants before security. Mm -hmm. Most of them have exactly what we have or less. Um, and that includes not just LAX, but Long Beach, you know, and airports more on our size. Right. Well, maybe not a second restaurant like your, like, I'm not suggesting that, but just sort of the signage or the marketing to say you can order something and have it bring, brought back because, you know. That, the restaurant know. did just put one. Good. Right as you walk in the door. So okay. hopefully people will see it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the debt service went up almost double in the last couple of years, and we can expect why. That, that, that Imagine that's terminal costs. And it, the lease incomes don't match that. Could you describe um, what the longer-term plan is for covering it? Presumably the, the notion is to cover that increase in debt uh, in, in a planned way. <laughs> Part of the debt is covered by our passenger facility charge, and I'll let you describe if that's what you're talking about. That, and I think uh, a point in prior years, remember, while we were under construction, we had capitalized interest, and so that fund – not operational monies, but the capitalized interest fund paid the debt service. And then last year we began with one debt service payment, which was half of a full year. We pay in December and uh, July or I think that's right, either January and July or yeah. December and June. So this year the debt service is like $1.8 million out of operations, and then the balance of it comes out of the pasture facility charge. And when we issued the bonds, that was the way the, the repayment schedule was established. Does that make sense? I'm sure it does, but I don't understand it. But that's, <laughs> that's another story. Um, and perhaps we can, you can, we can have a I'll, I'll call you and talk, okay. ask you about that a little more. The, also, I just noticed that the passenger facility charges had a bump. It's, it's a one-time bump there, seemingly, or in the uh, – uh, was it projected for, for 2013? That's a million and a half, and it's lower on either side. Can you describe why that bump is contemplated? The um... – Like 150000 the revenue is based on in-plane passengers and those who purchase tickets and then those that are coming into the airport, and that fee's $4.50 per ticket. So if the passengers go down, then our revenues go down. If they go up, then we'll uh, receive more passenger facility charge revenue. Uh, we do have – we have been accumulating revenues in that particular fund for debt service um, I believe the application was approved in December of 2008 or January of 2009. So we do have surplus revenues in that particular fund should our annual revenues go down. But we do have additional funds there. But it is based on passenger levels and passenger uh, employments. Okay. Thank you. Mr. House. 
Um, thank you for uh, letting me have a second uh, stab at this. Uh, first of all, I just want to reinforce what the mayor had said about the luggage situation. I just want to say it's really unacceptable. I mean, it's like not even just like, okay, kind of like, you know, even if we can't do anything about it, we got to do something about it. Because, I mean, we just built this amazing facility for these airlines to be able to make money. <laughs> and here we are, you know, you would think in a place that intimate and that close that they could manage to just get over there, Johnny on the spot, and bring the luggage over. There's nothing else that has to be checked. It's just brought over and put on the thing. It's got to be the simplest of all the, you know, it's like totally low tech. Just, you know, so I don't know how you emphasize from the city council level that there's more than an interest. It's a demand. Get it right. Do it now, fast. And I just, you know, may, I don't know if there's more you want to say about that, but I just want to amplify that. And the, um, and I had no idea about the fact that you could have food brought down and you could be with your family. I don't know how I missed that, so market it. Um, the, real, um, the real question I have here goes to the specific plan area. I mean, I still talk about it like that from the days that we had all sorts of ideas and plans and, and there were proposals and big, now there's these big empty lots. You know, it's kind of like the big hole in the ground at the airport. Now, you're still making money on the rentals that seem to be pretty remarkable, given the state of affairs over there. But there's this great big empty space that could be generating significantly more revenue, I would think, if it were fully developed. And it would also boost our local economy in terms of our economic development plans and where we want to go as our subregion. Um, the, the greatest possible thing the city of Santa Barbara could do would be to get that area developed with the kind of um, roll-up door light manufacturing research connection to the university, you know, with the people going to school there and fulfilling their dreams right there in our community. I mean, that, that's our dream, right? So, you know, now we're talking about another master plan, but we've had this on the books as a, uh, um, a, what I would say is a viable dream. Now we're, we've waited out this recession, what can we do now to take action on what we've already created as a possibility for that area? What could we do right now? Because it would seem like that would alter even a whole lot of your future budget. Am I, am I missing something? It seems like that's the great opportunity for the city of Santa Barbara in terms of economic development without displacing anybody for anything. Well, once we got through the targets and all the other uses that came and went, um, Council did give us direction to look at the, the small light industrial use that was in the specific plan originally. We have been working with an architect um, on site plan as well as some uh, what do you call it? model styles for the, the buildings, um, which were ready to um, see what you know, ABR kind of thinks of the style of the building. Uh, but we have some other property, I don't know what you want to say about that. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll also be scheduling a closed session with the council, I think in the next three weeks, about a potential tenant for at least par part of the property where we've received an unsolicited offer. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we, we will have a place to discuss that. In the general, without knowing anything of the specifics of something like that, I can say with great certainty, even based on my little business and seeing the, all the startups that are starting to happen now and the light manufacturing opportunities that people are growing out of their garage and they're looking for modestly priced quality, you know, the air-conditioned office, the roll-up door, the 2,000 square feet. I mean, there is a huge market for that. We don't have enough of it. The great big pop-ups they put out there where Decker's is going, that's out of scale. You know, you see people using the Mammoth building over there and it's just totally decrepit. We need quality space and the M1 zone doesn't provide it at that level yet. So I want to be a real strong advocate for us putting something in there as soon as possible and, um, and following through on, on that. So anyway, thank you. I think that's it. Thank you very much. We doing, keep on rolling? Waterfront? Waterfront. Okay. Sorry. I just didn't know what to say.
Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Brian Bossy. I'm the Waterfront Business Manager with the City's Waterfront Department. And I'm pleased to be here with uh, our Director, Scott Reedman, our Facilities Manager, Carl Triberg, and our Operations Manager, Mick Cronman. I should also note that uh, Jim Sloan, one of our Harbor Commissioners, is in the crowd tonight, or today. Hopefully this won't go till tonight. Uh, <laughs> we are here today to present our two-year uh, recommended budget, staff recommended budget for fiscal year 2014 and 2015. We're going to focus more on the fiscal year 2014, knowing that if down the line we need to make changes, we can do that at mid-cycle uh, next year. First, a department overview. Uh, we have 46 full-time employees at the Waterfront Department that are broken out into nine different programs. Uh, our permanent staff includes four managers. Uh, five supervisors, 10 Harbor Patrol officers, and 27 general employees. We've had no permanent staffing increase in the last 11 years. So we continue to run uh, the waterfront as it was 11 years ago, just with more modern technology and things like that. Our hourly employees, we do have them in both Harbor Patrol as well as our facilities program, and the overwhelming majority of those hourly employees come from our parking services. Um, that can fluctuate between 30 and 50, depending on the season. Um, we have overall, with hourly employees through the whole department, have seen are seeing a decline in the use of our hourly employees, and thus the hourly um, funding for that. Waterfront department revenue uh, for fiscal year 2014. Our budgeted revenue is. $12,445,000, a touch above that. That's a 3% increase over fiscal year uh, 2013. It's primarily, our revenues are primarily composed of three different areas. Uh, first is our marina management. Uh, that includes slip fees, uh, slip transfer fees, and things of that nature. Uh, next in line is our property management program, and that includes all our leases, uh, whether commercial or restaurant. Uh, we do have over 250 250,000 square feet of leasable space that we manage. Um, next are our parking services. We have eight different parking lots uh, in the waterfront department all along Cabrillo Boulevard there, and that accounts for about $2,262,000. And lastly, we have interest at 1.1% of our overall revenue. And I want to let you know over, you'll see this in a couple of slides right here, page H438. That's just if you're curious, that's where you can find this information uh, in your budget book. Madam Mayor, in, in, our, in the book on that page, it says other revenue. And for 2014, it looks like 392000 So it, where, where does that, is that property management? No. That comes in. That's a great question, Madam Mayor. Uh, Council Member Mario, that comes, the other revenue on your budget page comes into property management. Uh, three, about $300,000 of that budgeted uh, revenue comes from cruise ships, and um, the additional uh, roughly $90,000 comes from a, an assortment of odds and ends, including the harbor, a small amount from the Harbor and Seafood Festival. Um, we rent out some of our facilities to local nonprofits and groups that use, for example, our marina classroom. So odds and ends like that. It's just such a big fat number. Yeah. You know, and when you look at the general fund, you're like, oh, 400,000 just hanging around, you know, so thank you. Yeah, and we just like to separate that cruise ship revenue just to keep track of it. As far as expenditures, um, fiscal year 14, our operating expenditures, a little bit shy of 11.9 million, and that's equal to about one half of 1% increase. Again, you can find this uh, in your budget document on page H438. Um, the, the bigger expenditures, um, I'll, I'll go over real quickly. You've got supplies and services at about 31%, a little over 3.7 million. Our salary and benefits uh, are at 49%. And again, we haven't had an increase in our staffing in over 11 years. Um, we also have another big number down there is our debt service, and that's at $1.8 million. And those comprise our, the primary waterfront department expenditures. As far as um, waterfront, our budget, our program highlights um, administration. 
Um, we plan on continuing to provide the community with, uh, with great events such as the Harbor and Seafood Festival, which I just mentioned, uh, that comes in the second Saturday in October. This past year we had over 14,000 visitors uh, to the sea Harbor and Seafood Festival. Um, we play a major role in the July 4th celebration at the city. We are responsible for the contracting of uh, the wonderful fireworks that take place um, as for not only July 4th, but also our Parade of Lights. Uh, regarding property management, um, we continue to work with our various merchants associations, immediate as well as not so immediate, and by that I mean our Harbor our Harbor Merchants Association, our Stearns Wharf Merchants Association, but we also um, work with the downtown organization as well as the Chamber of Commerce, especially when it comes to cruise ship activity. Our parking services, a program highlight in the coming years, coming two years, um, we plan or we would like to install uh, some modern parking equipment. I'll get into this a little bit later. I believe it's in the next slide with our capital program. Um, but we um, plan on modernizing our equipment. Um, it's extremely dated. And with that will come efficiencies for both the customer as well as uh, staff. On the marina management side, uh, we do manage over 1,100 uh, slips in the marina. And we continue to provide efficient service. But in order to make that even more efficient, uh, we are planning on installing a new marina management software program. Our software program that we have right now uh, was first installed in 1997. Um, and in terms of technological time, that's a few ice ages ago. So we're excited to replace that program with something more uh, modern. As far as facilities management is concerned, uh, this coming year, we plan on completing the preliminary design and engineering on phases five through eight of the Marina One replacement program. It's a multi-year program. It's been going on for a while now. We just uh, wrapped up a few extra or a few dock fingers recently. So this next year, there won't be construction as there has been in the past. Uh, we'll be focusing on the design and engineering, and then in fiscal year 15, get back to the construction of a few more uh, fingers. Our capital improvement program uh, for fiscal year 14, um, you'll see our capital funding at $1,455,000. Um, and that, again, is on page E34. And our significant capital projects uh, would include our parking services, uh, which I just mentioned, and that's $200,000 for a ski data parking system for our staffed parking lots. And that includes our Harbor Main parking lot, which is open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Our Los Banos exit, which is located adjacent to the pool, which we operate on heavier days, big weekends and uh, wet Wednesdays, things of that nature. Um, our Stearns Wharf uh, kiosk, which Last year, an interesting fact, we were able to begin counting people who uh, walk out onto the wharf um, through a, a system. We've installed a thermal imaging system, and it counted over 1.1 million pedestrians walking out onto Stearns Wharf. So that's just people walking out. Um, so as far as the cars going out, we tallied over uh, 250,000 uh, cars going out onto Stearns Wharf, and that takes into account or drops out a factor for service vehicles and you know the bread folks and the restaurant. We don't count them. Um, so a significant amount of traffic out there, so you can see why uh, improved uh, equipment would do a great deal there. And then also at our Leadbetter lot. Um, another capital project under um, Carl Triberg and our facilities folks is the sea landing improvements, uh, $250,000 for landscaping and walkway improvements. Um, this is, I have a slide next that I can show you exactly where this is, but this is, leads out to uh, sea landing. It gets a tremendous amount of traffic. You've got um, the seashell sailing group there. You've got sea landing, which is charters for various uh, fishing boats and things like that. And it's, this is also the on and off for our cruise ship visitors who, who uh, get off the ship and are ferried over to sea landing. You also have the kayaks and outriggers stationed there. So it's a a very heavily used area. And we've partnered, we, we are going to be partnering with Santa Barbara Beautiful on those uh, improvements as well. In fiscal year 2015, as I mentioned, um, we'll 
go back into the construction mode for our Marina One replacement. Uh, we'll be at phase five and we'll be replacing the J and K fingers as part of that next phase. Here is the, this is a little hard to see, but this is a, a rendering of sea landing. Here you have Cabrillo Boulevard. Um, these right here are what we call the seashell condos. But you're going to see new landscaping along here, um, replacing the Mayaporum trees. Um, we've also got new landscaping adjacent to the seashells. New landscaping out here. Um, this is the parking lot um, in and around the shower area that was installed as part of the West Beach Improvement Project. And then you'll see new railing um, and uh, new sidewalk area um, throughout this, this whole area. So a significant improvement to an area that is, is in much need of, of that improvement. Key budget changes uh, for this year. Um, for the second year in a row, um, the, the Waterfront Department is being um, hit with a significant loss or reduction in revenue. Last year, uh, fiscal year 13, it was uh, the decor uh, folks who transport oil workers out to the rigs and back. Um, they found a new home down south, and that resulted in about $150,000 loss, primarily in parking revenues. Um, this year, uh, the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum um, completed their lease buy-down uh, just this past month as of April 1st. And so with that buy-down, we're going to see a reduction in our property management lease revenues of $144,000 per year. Um, what is helping to make uh, those two voids up are cruise ship visits. Um, this coming year, we anticipate approximately 21 cruise ships visiting uh, the area, visiting Santa Barbara. And these are split up. Um, these don't come year-round. These are split up into what I call the shoulder seasons, kind of the not-as-busy seasons. Um, for example, yesterday, had the weather worked out, we would have completed um, our cruise ships for the springtime, and that's basically the, the April and May period. Um, in the fall, we'll see uh, cruise ships return about the middle of September and going into November. So it's those times of the year which are generally off for our businesses or not as strong as the winter holidays and the summer season. So we anticipate paid about 63,000 visitors from that. Um, and it's often asked, well, what happens when these people hit our soil? Where do they go? What happens? So over the, we've been working with uh, cruise ships um, as well as our Chamber of Commerce in trying to figure that out. And so for the first six visits of this year, this is the, the data we have. Um, when you're on a cruise ship and you come to a port, um, you sign up for activities well in advance. So they know exactly where everybody's going because they have to keep track of all these people. So as a result, in the first six ships that came this year, 97% of the passengers out of, uh, I believe it was a little over 12,000 total passengers, 97% of those passengers stayed in town. They were either participating in and signing up for trolley tours, uh, whale watching tours, um, uh, the funk zone wine tours, and then a, a good deal of them just, you know, hanging around, walking around State Street, walking over to the harbor. Um, the other 3%, um, or only 3%, I should say, participated um, in wine tasting tours over to the San Inez Valley. So I think that was about 323 people out of that 12,000 in the first, uh, first six shifts. So, that's good news. You know, we're keeping these people here where we want them um, to experience um, the immediate sights and sounds and tastes of Santa Barbara. Um, one other uh, key budget change, uh, we continue to, par to partner with our Parks and Recreation Department uh, with our Beach Lifeguard Program. The Waterfront Department is responsible for the, the budget, the lifeguard budget, an important uh, program, obviously, for a beachfront community. Um, this coming year, the, uh, what, the uh, sorry, the Parks and Recreation Department has seen a significant increase in activity on West Beach, and that's the area from Stearns Wharf over to Sea Landing. Um, you can see it in the volleyball courts and just people uh, hanging out. Um, they've seen a significant increase, and as part of that, um, they will be purchasing a new lifeguard tower, or they're proposing to purchase a new lifeguard tower. Um, and as a result of that, we would then be staffing that lifeguard tower. Um, the thought behind this is, 
with that increase in people, we'll have another set of eyes and ears on the beach. Um, this will also help um, with our Harbor Patrol folks who are responsible for patrolling that area to have that extra set of eyes and ears, a trained set of eyes and ears who's involved in safety is really going to help them out as well. So we look at this as, as definitely a partnership on West Beach. Our staff recommendation for fiscal year 2014 and 2015, uh, we are proposing a few fee adjustments. Um, the first is our slip transfer fee increase uh, but for both 2014 and 2015. This is in line with um, increases in the previous um, years. In 2014, uh, we're proposing, uh, proposing a, 25 foot, a $25 per foot increase, um, which will get your slip transfer fee to $350 a foot. And in the fiscal year 2015, sorry, the same again, a $25 per foot increase, which will then bring the slip transfer fee uh, to $375 per foot. I should note that this does not include the 20 foot slips, which are frozen at $200 uh, per foot. Our slip fee increase, uh, we are proposing a 2% increase for fiscal year 2014. Um, this is in line with previous increases over the last few years at approximately that rate. Um, this is also a requirement, I should say a loan covenant with our Department of Boater, Boating and Waterways loan, or, or yes, loan, um, that helps fund our, our Marina One replacement project. So as part of that, they need to make sure that we're receiving an adequate income in order to cover the, the cost of that loan. And that is a loan in which we only pay as much as we draw down on it, sort of like a home equity loan in that sense. Um, and if you're curious as far as slip fees are concerned, we do take a survey uh, the early part of every year. Uh, we survey 18 marinas on a number of, of issues, including fees and services. And we are always um, at or below um, the middle or the average, um, especially we're, we're well below the average when it comes to um, publicly owned marinas south of Point Conception. So we offer in a very, we're a very attractive marina as far as, the, as fees and services are concerned. Um, regarding our self-pay parking lots, these are our parking lots at, uh, Cab let's see, Garden Street, Chase Palm Park, East and West Cabrillo, which are straddles both sides of the, the Cabrillo Arts Pavilion, um, as well as our uh, Harbor West parking lot. Um, we'd like to adjust those to come in line with our Harbor Main parking lot, which is $2 per hour or $12 uh, daily maximum. Um, currently, they stand at uh, $3 for three hours or $7 uh, max per day. And these are the lots that we've now installed with the, what's called the Luke system. It's a pay on foot system. It's not the shove your dollar bill. We got, those are all gone. Um, so we have 13 Luke systems um, that are much more efficient and friendly for folks it, um, to use. And I think what happens is people get a little bit confused. Our rates seem to vary all across the board. So this would put those all in line except with Stearns Wharf, which is a completely different animal. Our Harbor Commission uh, recommendation, we were at the Harbor Commission in January, February, and March with budget items. Um, and they agreed with our fee, the, the staff's proposed fee increases as well as uh, the overall budget for fiscal year 2014, 2015. However, what they did was recommended was to move forward a recommendation to the City Council for approval of the Waterfront Department's proposed fiscal year 2014 and 2015 budget, provided that the Waterfront Parking Lot Landscaping Services be put out to a competitive bid. And right now, um, Parks and Rec does our uh, parking lot, our Waterfront Parking Lot Landscaping Services. So with that, um, that completes my presentation, and we're all here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, Mr. Bossy, I was, I, that last point about the landscaping and going on with the lifeguards and lifeguard towers and whatnot, so the relationship between Waterfront and Parks and Rec, because that's been uh, kind of an exchange of labor and funds and whatnot over the last few years. So can you kind of synopsize where that is? I mean, what was Park and Rec domain at one time that is now being 
now being taken care of by Waterfront. And, and in terms of that also with the Lifeguard Tower, I, said, I suppose the capital expense of Lifeguard Tower is Parks and Recs still, but the, the labor expense is Waterfronts. Is that I, – I, I, and take it away, Mr. Director. <laughs> Councilmember Rouse, um, the waterfront over the last few years has absorbed some of some things that were formerly parks and recreation responsibility. Uh, some of the beachfront restrooms, uh, the one at the foot of the wharf and State Street there, uh, the one at the visitor center in the Garden Street lot, and the one at Ledbetter. So we're now maintaining those. Um, we also took over the beach lifeguard program, uh, and the. Um, Parks and Recreation continues to run that through their aquatics program, but we reimburse them uh, on a 12 times a month basis for that. So we got together with um, Rich Hanna, the aquatics manager, um, this year, and well, actually last year he first floated the idea of expanding to West Beach because it's just been growing and growing in popularity. And our Harbor Patrol, um, Nick, our uh, Harbor Oper Hopper Operations Manager, and Steve McCullough, our Harbor Patrol Supervisor, agreed that this would be a good thing to augment what we're already patrolling down on West Beach. So we agreed, and uh, Parks had some money in their capital, in their aquatics capital program to provide the tower, and we'll provide the additional staffing. We'll reimburse for the ad additional staffing. So they're basically still park and rec programs, but Waterfront reimburses them, doesn't really own the program per se. For the beach lifeguards, yes. Right, and then the landscaping, I remember that when that kind of came down the pike before, having Waterfront take on a greater part of the burden of the Waterfront landscaping or the parking landscaping or that. Once again, that was always kind of a gray area for me why Parks and Rec was there or, or, or what Waterfront's responsibility was. Correct. Um, Parks and Recreation historically lands, uh, handled the tree trimming, landscaping, storm cleanup and stuff um, in the parking lots, in the waterfront parking lots. And so quite a few years ago now that was uh, is similar to the Beach Lifeguard Program. They continue to provide the service, but the Waterfront Department reimburses for that service. All right, very good. If I may, Madam Mayor, I have a couple hey. other questions. You have the mic. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the uh, the cruise ship revenues and expenditures, and maybe it's too early to tell, uh, you have a number that was estimated for cruise ship revenues. Your The Waterfront's cruise ship expenditures, i.e., for the extra shuttle, coning, staffing, uh, do you have that, um, can you give us an idea where you are on that in terms of how a waterfront nets out, if so? That, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Ross, that's a great question. Um, it's not free. Um, we do have considerable expenditures. Uh, based on 21, uh, uh, approximately 21 cruise ships uh, coming next year, and I should advise you that it's a fickle industry. Um, we had a cruise ship schedule for yesterday, and 99% of Santa Barbara was basking in sun and heat, and there was a significant fog bank right off the coast, and they were, due to safety reasons, uh, could not disembark. So that was one less. So it is a fickle industry. Um, over, uh, estimating 21 uh, cruise ship visits next year, again, split between the, the fall and the, and the spring, uh, we anticipate about... Um, about f I think it's $400,000 in revenue. However, the costs that we have to pay for include uh, shuttle ser additional shuttle service for MTD, which totals about $85,000. Uh, we also pay for um, the production of brochures um, to the tune of about $5,000. We also assist the downtown organization um, with some of their supplies um, that they need to run the program, which is about $10,000 a year. And we also pay 7500 approximately $7,500 for uh, City of Santa Barbara public works permits um, regarding the street. So in sum, we pay about, it's a little over um, $100,000 in expenditures. Um, so it's about 25% of when you compare revenues to expenditures. I'd, yeah, I should also note that police, um, there's a significant police presence. They are paid directly by the cruise ships. Um, and one thing that's not included in that, uh, that 25 percent is the soft costs we have. Um, we have a staff member out there the entire day, sometimes 7 in the morning till 5 o'clock at night, um, helping coordinate. We also have a significant, significant participation by our parking staff, um, setting up cones, setting up tents, setting all that stuff up, as well as 
um, storage charges, um, we have to put all that gear somewhere. And so we, we have been renting a storage bin for Marborg that's set out there to make it that much easier. Um, so it's a significant amount of effort uh, on our part. Okay, thank you. And then jumping to one more subject, and then I'll, I'll get out of your way. Uh, regarding the buy-down of the lease for the Maritime Museum. So there was a one-time uh, revenue uh, generated by the, the department, and now, you're, of course, we're taking it off the, off the uh, one-time yeah, revenue, but we're taking it off the revenue side of operations because you will be getting that much less. So where does that express their buy-down amount, and how does that balance out? Uh, just because you know, most of the people don't really understand what that was all about. Uh, how does that balance out in terms of revenue versus the loss on your balance sheet for your operations? Uh, Council Member Rouse, that was negotiated uh, five years ago. Um, John Bridley and myself and the Maritime Museum staff worked through that with a little bit of nudging from the City Council. And the idea was um, a buy-down amount of a million dollars if they wanted to pay it off up front, and that would relieve them of their base rent payments for the duration of the lease. In lieu of doing that, they could continue to pay their rent for five years, and all rents paid would be credited toward that million dollars. So that's the way they chose to go. Um, they continued to pay their rents. All of that was credited toward the million, million dollars, and we received a check for approximately $270,000 in April, which was what was the balance of that million. So we saw a little bump in our property management revenue this year, and then we'll see a corresponding dip in future years. The museum will continue to pay their common area maintenance charges, which are not insignificant, and their berthing fees for their display vessels in front of the museum, and a small, a real nominal amount of rent for the museum store there. So um, it, it's an equi equitable agreement. It, it worked out well. Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I had that same question. Um, you have. Did you say what, what was the total square footage of the buildings that that the, you managed to send the 200 plus two to 250 square feet? Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member White, yeah, approximately 250,000 square feet. So the and the maintenance of those buildings obviously is in the, in that environment is a is an enormous task. So and and expensive. It is a constant task yeah. every and day. It's, and it's many it's of those buildings are are older too. Exactly, and then you have structures. This includes the wharf as well, so it's not only the harbor proper, it's also the wharf. So you're exposed to the marine environment, which has a whole host of issues in and of itself. Um, then you add a, a host of buildings out on the wharf, which is not a normal thing, but definitely a, a, a good one. And there's and they're in the um, capital section, there's even a, a recurring cost for timbers and such like on the, on the pier, which I can sure understand. Um, but I'm just not. I I don't have the sense that are we. We're trouble. We're having a problem in citywide with adequate maintenance. With we're sort of. It's just a, that that struggle is definitely uh, one that we're facing all the time. On the waterfront, with that 250,000 square feet, how are we doing vis-a-vis -vis maintenance and uh, with those buildings? Are we holding our own? Madam Mayor, Council Member White, uh, we are holding our own. We have a staff fully devoted to that. Um, we do a good job, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, quite often things pop up. Um, we recently had a restroom remodel that's currently taking place below Brophy Brothers. Um, it was slated to cost one amount, but when the walls were pulled away, um, there was a significant amount of damage. So. You know, we're in, we get our surprises just like everybody else um, with aging infrastructure. Um, but Carl Triberg and his staff, um, they're out there every day. You've got the power replacement project on Stern's Wharf to the tune of about three hundred and twenty-five to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year, making sure those piles are either new ones are installed or old ones are maintained. Um, and uh, similar situations, you have aging uh, infrastructure as far as uh, HVAC equipment in a lot of the buildings. So. We, we do plan out with our capital program. We, we actually look out at least six years um, for our capital projects and make sure that we're covering the, the things that we need to cover and yet maintaining our reserve balance in, in the appropriate manner. Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Would the gentleman from the Waterfront Commission like to speak regarding this uh, requirement that services be put out to a competitive bid? I'd like to hear what the commission was thinking on that. 
Thank you for coming, by the way. Yeah. Well, uh, you could state your name for the record. What's that? State your oh, name for the Jim record. Jim Sloan. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you walk around the harbor, and especially that that west parking lot in the area, Ledbetter parking lots, in a lot of our opinions, the landscaping could use some better maintenance. And so it's come up on a number of, of council meetings or commission meetings, excuse me. And we've just um, finally, as part of the budget, we said, okay, it's a very expensive line item. I think it's to the tune of seven hundred thousand um, dollars a year. And so we were just looking at what we were getting for that. And there's a number of uh, commissioners that think that we might be uh, better served by having an outside contractor do it. And so that's kind of where we were at. I was talking with uh, the gentleman that owns. Uh, the Shoreline Cafe the other day, and he was putting some plants out there, out of the back of his car, Steve, and, and I was asking him, what are you doing? And he says, well, I put these out because that's the only way I can keep the front of my restaurant nice. And so it just helped reinforce some of that stuff. And so I know Parks and Recs is, uh, is doing the best job they can and everything, but to a number of people, it just looked like we might be better served by, by having someone else look at it. We, we haven't looked into any numbers yet on this, though. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, we haven't. We haven't done that at all. What, yeah. what we did at the last meeting was, as part of approving this budget, we said, okay, let's do that, but let's request the council, we request you people to, to allow us to go out and, and bid this and get some competitive. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Bossy, do we know how many people uh, Parks and Rec is using to service our lots? Madam Chair, uh, I wish I was Madam Chair, but we don't have a redevelopment oh, yeah. agency anymore. <laughs> I'm um, stuck in old okay. habits. I'm I know. sorry. It's okay, Mr. Bobby. Madam Mayor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Councilmember Hotchkiss. Um, we, I don't have an exact number on how many folks are dedicated to the waterfront de department landscape maintenance. Um, but, but just real quick, because there are so many numbers floating around, I just wanted to correct the number. It's uh, $239,000 per, per year. Um, for those landscaping services. So again, I don't. I Not don't. Seven hundred thousand. Stand corrected. Sorry. Okay, that's right. Um, well, like I said, there's a whole lot of numbers running around this place <laughs> right now. So it's $239,000 a year. And again, I'm, I'm not sure how many folks uh, there are dedicated, as you're well aware of um, staffing issues that Parks have over the house. They do their best. Right. And it wouldn't cost us anything to put this out and see who would like to take a look at it. Is that correct? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cost us anything just to take a look at it. We would have to put some staff time into putting together a very comprehensive spec to have a good, decent bid. I mean, right. after a storm comes through, we have an enormous amount of palm fronds that hit the ground, and Parks comes and cleans all that stuff up. And right. factoring something like that into a private sector bid, it, it, it's we would really have to be careful we don't cut, uh, sell ourselves short on that kind of service. Sure. sure, I understand. That's the reason I asked about the number of personnel, because if, in fact, we could free up some personnel for Parks and Rec to do other things, we have crushing needs elsewhere in our parks. So um, I would like to move that we approve the Waterfront Commission's suggestion and put this out for a bid. If I don't think second. we're in a um, agendized item where can we, we can but make can motions. We not? You can suggest that to bring it back. I would like to suggest that to bring it back. Thank you. And just, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, on this issue, I think if council directs us, we'll do that. But I think there's a, there's a lot of implications here because you, we've got existing employees. Their jobs could be affected. I think we also have a provision in our labor agreement with the SEIU that we need to at least advise them that we are looking at contracting out. You know, so there's there's a if council wants to do it, fine, and we'll. But we need to kind of list for you all of the implications of it. No, I understand. That's good that you brought that up too, and we should know those implications. So otherwise, we would might make an, make an unwise decision. But I would personally like to take a look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Ms. Maria. Thank you for asking that question, Councilmember Hotchkiss. I firmly oppose the idea unless the Waterfront Department has talked to the Parks Department and the employees and asked them to, you know, what's their work plan, what plants they're using. I re it really seems even that the Commission is getting ahead of themselves a little bit here. That's a very serious action to take. Um, you know, I respect our Parks Department, and like I say, there needs to be a process by which if, if there is some um, dissatisfaction with their, their um, work, then there needs to be a, a discussion, just as if a waterfront employee had been doing something that the Parks Department 
um, didn't like. And you also, Mr. Reedman, talk about the expense of the bid process. You know, uh, I would object to that as well. Um, so uh, I appreciate, Mr. Hotchkiss, if you are uh, thanking the, the commission for their work. I just, I think there's a lot more here, as Mr. Armstrong said. No, and we, we, should, look, look and we should look into that if we can save the city some money. I think we need to have the job well done, which is more, more to the point. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's what they were saying. Sometimes it's not that well done. Mr. Hess? Okay, so um, I've got a few things here. Um, the, uh, the, we, we still own uh, the parking lots below City College or over there in the flatlands below the bluffs, right? And we, those are the cities, and they're overseen by Waterfront. Am I correct in that? Um, the Waterfront Department is principally responsible for the Leadbetter parking lot and the Harbor West parking lot. Mm -hmm. We have a, a joint powers agreement dating back to 1962 where we have sort of a shared responsibility with City College, but primarily City College operates the uh, La Playa, what we refer to as the Playa lot, La Playa lots north of the boulevard. When does that agreement end? I mean, is, that, is there something there for us to really be considering, uh, you know, really looking at that? It's a pretty important resource. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member House, this is the same agreement that has to deal with Pershing Park and the odds and ends and the baseball field, oh, and it, it's right. all intertwined. So um, that's right, because of the the ownership of different pieces of the whole thing. I remember you've explained this before. Tried to. Yeah, so it's part of a much larger <laughs> monster. Okay, that yeah, explains the look lots. in your faces when I ask the question. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Kamadi knows about this um, as we look forward um, and um, to this opportunity for the federal authority for beach reclamation, um, a funding source of um, some proportion for the coastline. And we've recently issued a letter to the um, um, to the powers that be. I can't remember exactly to whom it went. Um, but it's, it really talks about uh, beach reclamation. It also will eventually uh, um, provide funding that will support sort of the natural means of, of, of beach nourishment, including additional funding that would be able to support some of our dredging efforts in the different harbors along the way. And I'd like to know if you've got that in your, on your radar, if you're looking forward to, um, uh, to supporting that effort. And if, um, if it's not, maybe we need to uh, talk more about it. But that came up at Beacon just recently. Um, pretty strong uh, and vigorous support from our board at the Beacon board, including a letter and also increased funds for lobbying efforts in Washington to support this additional funding for our coast. Um, where is our waterfront in that conversation? Madam Mayor, Council Member House, um, the main dredging authority is under the Rivers and Harbors Act, and I'm happy to report that the President included $2.6 million in uh, the FY14 budget for dredging, which is good. This is the Water Resources Development Act, which is another uh, authorization, federal mm -hmm. authorization, right. for which they could appropriate funds to uh, complement the dredging through regional sediment management. And this is projects that would have to mentor Santa Barbara counties. Uh, we recently drafted a, a letter for the mayor's signature to send to, I believe it was Senators Boxer, Feinstein, and Congresswoman Capps in support of this. Mm -hmm. It's in the Senate, I believe, right now, uh, being debated at, at a lower level. Hasn't made it up to the President yet, but it's got the attention of a lot of people and uh, something we do support because dredging is vitally important to not only the city of Santa Barbara, but the, our region in general. Good, thank you for that. I just wanted to really, uh, I didn't know whether you were coordinating with the mayor in that letter. I know she sent the letter. Thank you very much. Um, on the cruise ship uh, revenue and the cost, so am I understanding there's a, there is at least at this point a net gain, and you're tracking that, and I think that was the reason for the question, is you're really cognizant of the costs and the revenue. We're charging, according to the newspaper, fifteen to $20,000 for the landing, well, what's it called, the fee for um, coming into our area uh, for each one of the ships, and that's where the $400,000 comes from. So are you keeping that as a separate account so that we can continue to see where we stand in that whole enterprise? Council Member House, yes, we are. We have a separate revenue line item to track the revenue, and, and uh, we have a separate expense line item for all these little 
things, the, the biggest being MTD, as, as um, Brian mentioned, mm -hmm. but also printing downtown organization broch brochures to the tune of $4,800 and just various, you know, things we're doing to support the DO and their volunteer efforts, advertising for volunteers and all that. So we're tracking all that. Okay, and then the, and I know DO is pretty proud of the effort that they've been making on getting volunteers to show up for the ships and greet the folks that come off. Um, where do we stand with regards to other um, harbors in terms of those costs? Have we taken a look to be sure that we're in line with the costs that are happening elsewhere? Or, are we, I mean, do we know if we're up above or below or where we stand in that? Madam Mayor, Council Member House, if you're um, looking to how much we charge in what you refer to as a fee um, for the cruise ships, we're significantly um, lower. Um, I shouldn't say significant. We're lower than, but you have to look at it too. These are this is Long Beach. These are much larger venues than what we have here. So it's commensurate. It, it makes good sense with the the fees structure we have now. I think it adds to um, Santa Barbara continuing to be an attractive place for uh, cruise ships to visit. So it is a little bit lower, but again, um, it's it's Santa Barbara and it's not. Los Angeles, so we're a little different operation where they can pull straight up and get people off. We've got to do the, the ferrying for folks as well. Understood. So now, I mean, the workload issue is one piece of it, but you are managing to, to ensure that it is in the black. And I yeah. think that's the, probably the most important part for the budget. Yes, that's correct. It's an important source of revenue for the Waterfront Department. Okay, very good. And then um, lastly, I think to this whole issue about um, – landscaping and the bid a bid process of some sort. I know that it just seems very attractive on the surface of it to, to go in that direction. When you begin to look at the complexities of it um, and the um, need, I think, as the, as the board member mentions a minute ago, for a very high standard in terms of quality of service. We, that's where the coordination between the two departments is critically important. If there is, a, if there is an issue with regards to the quality of the work product of some sort, and we have to really look to see how to adjust the budget for parks and recreation vis-a-vis -vis the gateway to the city of Santa Barbara along the shore, um, it seems like we should have that conversation. And I know that this, I mean, you that's one of those that you pull the one string and it begins to unravel the whole sweater. You've got a lot of things that come together here. If we need a report, I hope it's a very comprehensive one that takes into consideration these things like you're talking about when there's a major storm and how we've you know, you've got a fixed cost, basically, and then you've got to, are you going out to, how do you let the contractor know that that's coming and, and adequately, a, a, a compl you know, accomplish that? So there's just a whole lot to it, and I'm not in favor of just willy-nilly going out to bid. There's just too much involved there. So that's just a comment I want to say back to you. If it does come back to us in any sort of report, it should be a very comprehensive report that tries to take into consideration as much as you possibly can of all these additional uh, items and it's and it is important by the way for the budget of the Parks and Recreation Department and for the people that they have on staff with their years of expertise dealing with these issues um, it would be so hard I mean to imagine holding that standard and getting an RFP right um, anyway that's it that's just a comment on it thank you just a little institutional memory for us part of the conversation about the park maintenance and um, who does what and who pays for what. The, the original conversation had to do with the parking fee revenue all going to the waterfront department and yet the parks and rec department pay, paying in their own parks and rec department budget to maintain the lots and they're not getting any of the revenue. So that was the start of the conversation of what's equitable and that led to lifeguards and other, you know, who's using the facility and who's managing it and where's the revenue coming from from the people in that area. So that's been part of that discussion and it's a tricky one for sure um, speaking of just to follow up on this dealing with a what when you said about a competitive bid and competitive I guess the term what does that mean if it just means lowest cost but I guess my questions would be what are you getting for that cost and, and you as you mentioned after a storm incident um, you know, the level of service, the level of, of plants, I mean, all those kind of things. We don't have to answer it now because, you know, if it's coming back, that, that's part of what – well, I guess if it's a simple answer, what did they just – what did the Harbor Commission just mean competitive as in the lowest cost bid? Madam Mayor, I believe that's what they okay. uh, uh, meant. We, okay. We've been working with the parks for over 10 years. They've been uh, – uh, doing this landscape service for us, so we'd have to really come back with a, a detailed scope of work that right. someone could competitively okay. bid. 
And I guess uh, just following up, if there were concerns or complaints on the number and types of plants and replanting and stuff, I'd be curious to know how much that's been communicated to the Parks and Rec Forestry Department or the Landscaping Department, because if they don't know that there's a problem, how do they know to fix it? Uh, so, Madam Mayor, good point. I, I, they can bring that to my attention. I work directly with the Parks Department. If there's a specific area that is in need of attention, we can certainly discuss that and, and see if we can get that taken care of and improved. Okay. And then finally, um, and this might be preparation work for the second year of the two-year budget, but I want to bring up something that came up at the Public Works Department budget, and that had to do with MTD and the $40,000 shortfall for the um, waterfront shuttle. And I'm only specifically here talking about the shuttle from Stearns Wharf to the harbor, not to the zoo, because that's a whole other question. And as I understand what happened at the... Um, the Public Works Department, the 40000 is being some, somehow uh, paid for by MTD, so really this issue is something we need to look at in fiscal year 15 in terms of where is this $40,000 coming from. Um, there's the gap, but so we'll have the service, but um, there's a question of long-term what, what's going to happen. And so I was looking at, and so there's a question came up, you know, what about the Waterfront Department? Is there a nexus there in terms of helping bridge that gap? And I don't have the answer to that, but it was just looking at some numbers here. On page H443, which is the property management page, um, the lease income for, let's say, fiscal year 2015 is $4.4 .4 million. So 40000 of that is, what, 1% of that? Um, a little less than that. Um, so just to put in, you know, because what would be the purpose of having the shuttle go to and from the Stearns Wharf in the harbor so people can go to the restaurants and shop at the shops and, you know, and, and earn more revenue. So my question is, remind me please on the leases, a lot, many of the leases you have a base rate rent and then after a certain point it's based on their overall gross receipts, right? And it's a percentage of gross receipts. So the better an organ, a better business does, the better the waterfront department does in terms of the lease. Is that correct? Madam Mayor, that is correct. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious if maybe and maybe do this kind of exercise of not touch the base rent because if a business is having a couple bad months or something, it's not to eat into um, their, their, their fixed cost. But as their revenues go up, does it make sense to have some portion of their lease, a tiny portion of their lease, help fund things like the waterfront shuttle that will bring more people to their business to buy more stuff and eat more food and you know and is there a nexus there and um, like I said I don't know the answer to that but I'd be curious to know if there is any kind of way to look at that obviously you can only do that as leases are up you can't you're not going to go in the middle of a lease in the middle of their um, contract but as leases come up is there a shuttle component to it that can only would only be applied if you know if and when they go beyond their base rent and um, it's just a thought of trying to find without you know now that RDA is done and we're trying to find new sources of revenues would that make sense without adding an extra burden to the businesses there and in fact as use it as a type of incentive to help them create more business by the use of the shuttle so um, I just want to just throw that out there maybe that's something you could look at in the next few months and if because we are going to have to grapple with this issue in the second year and a year from now so mr. white thank you madam mayor on that on that topic I just in the conversation that we had was a two weeks ago or whenever it was um, I just I feel like that is that that little package is one to look at to, just to bring back to, to 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 toss around because I remember as I recall the uh, MTD rep saying that there were an average of something like three passengers that was to the zoo. That was to the zoo, not to the harbor. That was from Stearns Wharf to the zoo. Anyway, I would right. appreciate having that be a topic that we yeah. that we that we look at as a, as a package because um, we all want the same thing of efficient uh, service, and but we don't want to be wasteful about it either. Right. So maybe we could have a chance to look at that 
that and, system. And I, yeah, and I'm not suggesting I have the answer here, but maybe that's the conversation with the Harbor Merchants Association with, you know, just to start that conversation. Is it something that they want to see more frequent shuttle service? Does that help them? And if so, you know, what's the cost associated with that? And is there a nexus somehow in terms of helping uh, fund that service? So just throw that out there. Yeah, Madam Mayor, the uh, Harbor Merchants Association is supportive of the shuttle service, even though, you know, by all appearances, it's underutilized. But they believe as we see more and more European travelers, that Europeans get it. They get public transportation and shuttles and things like that. A lot of the foreign visitors do. And so, you know, we've talked about it. Jim and I met with Public Works on this thing. And I, I guess we just hope that the fare box revenue recovers from the big hit it took when they doubled the rate and that we don't have to have this discussion necessarily okay. but um, the merchants for their part would like to see it happen and we support them to the tune of fifty thousand dollars a year in in cooperative advertising and promotion too so there's a, there's a possibility that maybe some of that could be sent that way right uh, to support and, them. and for the and I'm talking about whatever funding you do be directly about service to the waterfront not other parts of MTD, you know, and maybe that's a Harbor Commission MTD joint com conversation. I don't know, but it seems like the alternate transportation, the MTD budget in, is hurting in a lot of different areas, and this might be a, a partnership that's worth exploring a little more, I don't know, um, in some other ways that we haven't thought about before. So, okay, Mr. House? Yeah, you know, just, I mean, to jump on that bandwagon, I mean, it may very well be, although you may have already figured out places you want to spend the money from the cruise ships. I mean, the fact is that if we if we look at offsetting places that were kind of kind of a windfall in a way out of um, over the past year and a half or so, two years, we've started to see that pick up. Um, maybe there's, uh, not to come up with the solution, but I think it's worth the creative um, uh, the idea of having the more frequent service will engender more use. We know that the fair that was an issue that really you could see it just fall off right and yet there was a there's an interest in using it not just by people that are just hanging out on it back and forth but by real users so um, you had a lot of support on the council for finding some way to solve this when it was here before us the other day just want to let's take that ball and run with it any other questions mr. Rouse well, I just wanted to comment about the, the use of cruise ship fees and the use of uh, or whatever goes on with the harbor merchants and their leases is that the cruise ship, as uh, Mr. Bossy pointed out, is, is, is a fickle industry, and, and, and we are getting this amazing pump this year. But uh, if circumstances change in Mexico, for example, or other things change, we could budget for this and have this line item revenue that goes away in two years, and then boom, we've got an issue. So I'm going to be a little cautious about wanting to commit to another program or a new new kind of subsidy, because I think that could turn around and bite us in the, in the merchant rear so to speak, having been a merchant down there myself at one time in my career. Great. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you very much. Are we, do we need a break or are we just want to go through about a five minute council break? Okay, and then we'll go on to solid waste. To uh, help solve our, our budget deficit at that point, we did raise about $420,000 that went into this big solid waste fee pot and moving forward in FY14 we're going to show that as its own line item so we're going to uh, blend the um, the recycling fee the regional program fee uh, and that additional October 11 fee into one line item so on a net basis um, it hasn't changed but as we look at the detail um, that's the reasoning for that uh, that difference <clears throat> um, one of the additional uh, Revenue line items that we added in FY14 is for Marburg recycling, and that's about a third of the way down the column there. Uh, one of the things, and it's it's one of our key objectives for 2014, is that we are going to be working with Marburg to uh, establish a similar revenue sharing agreement with Marburg for our business recyclables, similar to what we have through Gold Coast Recycling in the county. Um, at present. Marburg collects the business dumpsters, commingled containers, uh, and then they process and market those commodities. We would like them to share that revenue. So one of our objectives for the coming year is we would like to negotiate an agreement with, with Marburg uh, in FY14. Since it'll be about a half a year, we're estimating we put in a small amount of 25,000, but that number should grow um, uh, in, in out years. 
Excuse uh, me. Will this require renegotiation of our contract with Marburg? It, uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Hodgkins, it will not require us to renegotiate the franchise agreement. We uh, intentionally kept those two issues separate. So we'll be able to do this recycling revenue sharing agreement completely on the site and not have an intersection with the franchise I don't think agreement. we want to open that can of worms. Thanks. Right. Uh, I'm going to skip past public education and tackle that at the end. Uh, so I will skip to the grants. And what you'll see is that our grant revenue has decreased uh, quite substantially uh, since 2012. The reason for that is uh, that the Ealings Park project where the uh, state gave us uh, about $800,000 has, has come to an end. And our remaining grant fund funding is about the 20000 that we receive every year from the state for the bottle and can redemption value. Um, the, the last category that I'd like to call your attention to is the other category at the bottom. And what you'll notice is that under FY13, we see a large one-time spike in other revenues that then drops dramatically again down to $2,500 in FY14. This FY13 projected amount of about $300,000 is that amount that we negotiated with Marburg as part of our final negotiations on the new uh, garbage contract. So uh, one, of the, one of the contractual agreements was that Marburg for FY13 would continue the Zone 1 and Zone 2 revenue concession that we had had since uh, 2012, uh, and they would continue that through this year. So we see that one-time spike in FY13 revenues, and then it drops down again to $2,500. Um, coming back to uh, the public education uh, funding, I wanted to spend a couple of, of minutes on that. Uh, as, as with previous years, uh, every year we are contractually, Marburg is contractually obligated to uh, give to the division about $141,000 in revenue to be used for public education. We use that for a number of outreach endeavors. We produce radio spots. We produce some television spots, English and Spanish. Most recently, some of you have seen this brochure, this tricolor brochure announcing the new uh, franchise agreement and how residents can use those services. We, we blanketed the city. We sent out 24,000 of these. Um, for those of you that were at the SOS banquet last week, you saw the uh, spot that we produced with the high school to outreach to high school students. So every year we have a pretty robust marketing plan, and we use that $141,000 for that purpose. One of those contracts, one, or one of the contractors that we contract with uh, using that funds is a group called Explore Ecology and what used to be known as Art for Scrap. We've had an ongoing contract with them for uh, years and years, probably upwards of 20 years. Uh, that contract amount has hovered around $25,000. And one of the things that we would like to do in FY14 is to decrease their contract amount by about $15,000 and use that money to bring the curriculum up to date. We've had this contract for 20 years. We have never really uh, revised our curriculum. The, the solid waste landscape has changed dramatically over the last two decades, both on a general global basis as well as on a city-specific basis. If you just look at our contract these days and what we're negotiating or looking into with the resource recovery project, you see that the landscape has changed quite dramatically. We would like to put out an RFP in FY14 to bring that curriculum up to something that reflects the goals that we are trying to accomplish here at the city. Um, the reason why I bring this up is that I, my understanding is that some representatives of Explore Ecology are here. They would like to talk to you about uh, that reduction in their contract services, but I wanted to give you the context for what we had in mind for FY14. Uh, any questions on revenues or expenditures? Then I'll go on to, to the, the fees. Um, just to that last point, I know we'll have more of a discussion later. Um, you're talking about $15,000 is what you're saying would be needed to to generate that new uh, curriculum. That's a, that's your estimate of what it would be, and you're going to send out an RFP to do that? That's our current estimate. I don't know the exact numbers because we haven't done it, but that's that's a good guess. Okay, and the, there's um, has the city considered reaching out to any of the local foundations, Orfala and the other ones that – maybe would really have a strong interest in seeing this kind of curriculum be developed and that way 
have, have we done any of that kind of um, looking outside? Because it doesn't look like the grants have really, you know, are reflecting that. Yeah, Council, Mayor, uh, Council Member House, um, I haven't looked at Orfila yet. I'm thinking that they may actually be one of the folks that submit a proposal. I mean, we could, but we're, we're really looking right now at who, you know, who could or who would be submitting a proposal to develop that curriculum. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Orfila actually submitted a well, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. Be, I just meant that as an example because yeah. they have supported, financially supported those kinds of efforts mm -hmm. in the past, but there certainly are others as well. And it, so it doesn't sound like at this point you're, you're looking at adjusting the budget to do this as opposed to seeking outside funding to be able to accomplish the same thing and keeping the relationship with um, the organization formerly known as Art from Scrap um, whole. And so um, I'll be interested to hear the rest of the discussion. I just want to raise that as a possibility. Mr. Rass. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Four, you talked uh, about a bad debt number, a, col a collection number by 214000 Is that? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Rouse, the, the bad debt allocation for FY14 is 100000 So of that 214000 of other uh, uh, expenditures, about 100000 of that, is to account for historic bad debt that we are accounting for on the books as in another $50,000 increment to keep pace with the bad debt that we would expect in 2014. So it's about half and half. And that's just on ratepayers bills. Is that that's that correct. correct? But the revenue that the the 5% that we the city charges to to do that billing isn't listed as a part of the solid waste fund because that's that's not part of this, but the, the debt of not collecting that is that's correct. The billing fee goes to the general fund, and the bad debt is realized by the solid waste fund. All right, all right. Just that might come to that back to that later. Okay. Um, and then my next question was: This is part of my lack of institutional memory, but the solid waste uh, uh, department, and we're talking about the curriculum, we're talking about the educational piece of it, and whatnot. Um, at one point in time. My, my recollection was that it wasn't really a solid waste department per se prior to the food scraps program. I might be wrong about that, but in terms of the actual personnel needed to develop this curriculum, go out and go forward, I'm a, can you bring me up to speed on that? Because I'm not really sure what it is we're doing in terms of like what the you know your your your, your org chart does in terms of going out to the schools or doing mm -hmm. doing what we talked about and, and perhaps producing RFP to have somebody else do that. Sure. So. It's a good question. Right now, the, the solid waste or the environmental services division has one and a half FTEs that are outreach staff. Those are the uh, employees that go out to businesses. They do audits uh, at those businesses, help them set up recycling programs, help them save money. We do that at the schools. Uh, just in the last two weeks, we've gone out to five of the Santa Barbara School District campuses again and re-audited them, and we're finding ways to help them drop their bill. That's been the uh, crux of what they do. The, the dividing line with uh, Explore Ecology is uh, we have traditionally used a contractor to do the classroom piece. So whereas we've gone out to the teachers, the faculty, the administration, help them set up recycling programs, know what containers to order through Marburg, what other containers would be useful for their campus to consolidate different kinds of materials, and on a broader scale have that, um, those recycling programs in place, Explore Ecology has done the in-classroom work of teaching students uh, various lessons such as how do I reduce my waste? You know, the difference between using a reusable cup uh, or having a permanent cup that would then, you know, save dozens over the lifetime. And just so I, I, I have this correct, so the, you said the one point one and a half FTEs in environmental services, that does or does not, does not fall under the umbrella of solid waste? That does fall under the um, umbrella of solid waste. That, is, that, though, is that part of the, was it the 8.5 FTEs of solid waste? That's correct. So, but those, those are considered environmental services? Yes. All right. Thank you. And, and just to, to clarify, there's been a staff that's been doing this function for about the last, I'd say, 12, 13 years when the, when the council basically um, started the solid waste strategic plan probably late 1990s, early 2000, and then set a goal of 70% um, diversion. 
then we had to have a staff to implement the programs necessary to get us from where we were at the time, which was below 50% up to 70%. And so, and as well as manage the contract with uh, with a hauler and also interact with the county on all of the county programs that we're engaged in. So the, but so this program's got about a 12 or 13 year history. So is that then Mr. Armstrong, is that obligation or that goal, is that over and above the state obligation that the hauler is required to meet? Well, the current no, the, well, the haulers aren't. We're required as a city to meet that obligation, and, that. and, the, and so at the fifty percent diversion level. But then the council set a higher standard at seventy percent. But when our, in our contract, we required our hauler to, to That's meet. That's correct. Yeah. I know we're going to hear from Explore Ecology, but just to follow up on the context, so the current um, contract is twenty-five thousand, and the recommendation is to go for that contract to go to ten thousand. And then the balance of 15 to put out an RFP to create a new curriculum, and that's the money that would go to the winner of that bid, right? That's correct. So what what's the expectation from Environmental Services to explore ecology for that $10,000? What are they expected to do that's obviously going to be much different than what they have been doing? Right. So the expectation is that they narrow their focus to one specific module that they have developed, and that's the waste reduction module. We went out last year and, and looked at a variety, a number of their presentations in the classroom. That was the one that uh, we were most comfortable with them continuing, because regardless of uh, what changes may or may not be made to the curriculum, there are enough of the central tenets of the waste reduction curriculum that would transcend those changes. And so okay. we'd like them to focus on that module. Okay. And I know your budget here is talking about the operational budget for um, fiscal year 14. What is the department's reserve balance? Do you have one? And where is it in relation to council policy? How, how, what's the number for, of reserves that you have in, in your department? About two. So, Madam Mayor, Council Members, at the end of last year, our reserve balances were around $200,000. Um, they, the Solid Waste Fund is now an enterprise fund. A couple years ago, we made them from a, converted them from a special revenue fund to an enterprise fund, <clears throat> which means that they are now technically subject to the same policies like water fund would as, in wastewater. So our plan and expectation is that over time, we would have to find a way to build up those reserves to meet those requirements. But we have a little bit of reserves now. Um, next year, we're pre presenting a balanced budget, but the following year, because of recycling revenues primarily going down, we are intending to use, at least at this point, to use some of, some of those reserves. So um, that's where we stand right now. Okay. So the policy, the council policy would be you have 200000 right now. That's You're just starting to put money into the reserves because you didn't have that policy before. But what would be the, um, what would be the number that you're aiming for to reach policy? Yeah, you know, that's a good question because the, the budget, as you see, is $19.9 million, but most of that is payments to the haulers. So right. our, our real operating budget minus that would be right around two and a half, almost $3 million, so it would be 25% of that. 25% of, right, of two, three, about $3 million. $3 right? million. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions at this point? Okay, thank you. Let me turn on my microphone, sorry. So in, in fiscal year 14, uh, as you're aware, we have an entirely new rate schedule that's resulting from the franchise agreement that your council approved with Marborg in February. Um, and to the rates that were negotiated and approved as part of the contract in February, uh, we did uh, apply a contractual CPI and tipping fee adjustment to those rates. So they're about 2.6% higher than the rates that we brought to you in February. Those are contractual obligations that the city uh, passes on to Marburg every year. Um, and I'd like to just note that uh, part of that 2.6% is a surcharge on the tipping fee charged it to Higuis of about $2.45 per ton. And that's to cover the cost of the environmental impact report for the resource recovery project. Uh, the county is estimating that that would be a four-year surcharge to cover the cost of the EIR process. Uh, and this is something that we originally uh, brought to your council in November of uh, last year. Um, 
when we uh, when we were talking about uh, the resource recovery project. We'll have a robust and in-depth discussion about fees uh, with the Finance Committee tomorrow, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here today unless you'd like more. Just a quick question, uh, Mr. Forway. So that uh, 245, mm -hmm. is that going to be considered as part of the baseline for the future CPI adjustments, or is that going to go away at four years? Uh, the CPI is a uh, – we, we have two, you know, two adjustments to the tipping fee uh, – uh, actually, it would be. Yeah, it, it is going to be part of the baseline. Thank you. Yeah. But it does go away in four years. So we have a couple of uh, uh, key performance objectives that are outlined in your budget pages. Uh, the first is uh, no surprise in that the conversion technology, or what we're calling the resource recovery project now, will continue to be uh, a major um, target of our efforts uh, in FY14, we anticipate with the county and with the other participating agencies completing and participating in the environmental review process uh, as, a, as a responsible agency. Uh, we'll also be refining the structure of the contractual agreements between the participating agencies and the vendor or the vendors uh, in this case with the emergence of Marburg. Um, on May 1st, uh, the county did receive Marborg's proposal for the material recovery facility. So this summer, we will be spending a lot of time undertaking the same uh, in-depth um, evaluation of the technical and financial merits of that proposal. Uh, the second uh, major initiative is that should uh, this council approve the single-use bag ordinance, uh, we will be uh, having a lot of work in implementing that ordinance, uh, instructing consumers and regulated retailers how to comply, uh, and then setting up all of the systems for reporting uh, and, and overseeing the levels of compliance and ensuring compliance with the regulated community. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll also be working to establish a revenue sharing agreement with Marborg uh, for the commingled recyclables that they collect from business dumpsters throughout the city. Uh, the fourth one I'm, I'm particularly uh, excited about, and that's uh, over the past about year and a half, we've been working very, very closely with the uh, Planning and Community Development Department to, uh, to become part of the review uh, cycle for projects. <clears throat> and what we've been trying to accomplish there is that it's much easier to work with developers and with contractors at the blueprint stage to make sure that uh, enclosures for trash and recycling are sized appropriately and located in an area that is uh, easy for Marburg trucks to access. Uh, we have found that uh, even without an ordinance, just having the ability to talk to uh, architects and developers, they've been very accommodating to, in, you know, to sizing those things so we don't get into the, the real tricky uh, messes that we see in the densely populated downtown of having nine different businesses all sharing one undersized enclosure. So one of the, uh, with that as background, one of the initiatives we're going to undertake and complete in FY14 is to develop waste generator profiles for customers of all types. So it could be a retail store, an office building, a medical clinic, a food service facility of, of various um, square footages. Um, that we will be able to use and we will be able to share with developers and architects so that they can adequately um, size those enclosures. Uh, the fifth one, as uh, Mr. Smario said, um, uh, we are balanced this year uh, in FY14. We're actually banking a surplus in FY13. And then in FY14, uh, with a drop in recycling revenue of about $325,000, um, we are uh, underfunded again. So one of the uh, initiatives we'll be undertaking in FY14 is to develop long-term options for balancing the solid waste fund uh, and we'll be uh, the operating budget and we'll be bringing that back to council for consideration. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Why don't we go to public comment? Stephen McIntosh. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Madam Mayor um, and Council. I'm Stephen McIntosh. I'm the Director of Development for Explore Ecology, um, <clears throat> formerly known as Art from Scrap. 
Uh, with me here today in Council Chambers are a couple of our board members, Joni Hollister and Kathy Snow. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to just um, remind you all, I'm sure everybody in this chamber knows, but for those watching on television in 1989, uh, AB 939 passed requiring 50% diversion from landfills by the year uh, 2000. Um, it, soon thereafter, Explore Ecology, then known, uh, then Art from Scrap, began providing education to students in the city of Santa Barbara um, and helping the city provide the required uh, education, recycling education to the students in its jurisdiction. And as Mr. Forrest said, um, for more than two decades, Explore Ecology has reached about 2,000 or between 2,000 and 2,500 students every year, kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, in the city of Santa Barbara. <clears throat> we're very proud of our programming. We are local, and we're proud to say that we're the leading provider of environmental education in, in Santa Barbara County. Um, unfortunately, we were recently informed, informed by staff um, that the city's proposing, or environmental services is proposing a 60% reduction to our contract for next year, taking it down, as you all stated earlier, from 24500 to $10,000. Um, at this level of funding, uh, next year we would only see approximately 700 students in the city out of approximately 6,000 elementary school students. Uh, we've also learned, and as you have been discussing, staff's um, intention is to remove the composting element of our curricula um, and limit it to the waste reduction or recycling and waste reduction and reuse uh, portion of the lesson. Uh, and staff plans on conducting an RFP to have an outside firm develop a new composting curriculum uh, and then conduct another RFP uh, to solicit and select a new vendor to provide or deliver the composting um, lessons for the 2014-2015 year, school year, which means no composting um, education happens next year. Uh, we would like to suggest that we work together, environmental services staff and Explore Ecology staff, um, spend some time together this summer uh, refining our existing composting lessons, which, by the way, I've observed also, and they are very good um, as they are now, but we could, we could refine them. Instead of taking the $15,000 out of the contract with Explore Ecology um, and utilizing it for an RFP process, impacting local employees at our organization, let's keep the number of kids that are being reached up next year and let's work together and develop the, comp the composting curriculum together. <clears throat> let's work together as partners, as we always have. Composting is not complicated. Anaerobic digestion is another matter that's several years down the road, and we should probably have a discussion about that down the road. Um, but between environmental services and Explore Ecology staff, we could develop a very effective and current curriculum for composting next year. We have senior environmental educators, like Tahara Ezradi, that have been doing this work for 20 years. She is one of the best. Uh, and myself, who actually oversaw the design and implementation of the city's food scraps program. Between Matt's staff and our staff, we have plenty of expertise in the room to, to revise or refine our composting curriculum. We're not here to tell your staff what to do. We understand that it's the city's prerogative to determine how to spend its funds. However, we do respectfully ask that the council consider this contract as part of its saw waste budget review process because we're concerned about the impact that such a significant reduction might have on our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? For, for, is for Mr. McIntosh? No. Thank oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Ma McIntosh. Uh, to the council. Okay, uh, Madam Mayor, just to, to go to that, I'll just make a quick comment, and it's, um, I really feel strongly that the, that, that invitation that we just got to work together as partners on this um, is really important. That's an organization that has provided a really constant and uh, excellent service over the years, and we don't want to do anything that could actually harm that effort. Um, we need to work together with them to seek the additional funding, this one-time cost, uh, make sure we keep constant with reaching out to the youth. And they are really the educators for their families. And it turns out that the kids get it first usually, and it goes right back up the chain. And um, I, I would really strongly urge us to um, find ways to keep composting in the program and to ensure that um, – um, why do I always forget the name of the ecology? 
Explore. Explore Ecology. I will get it. I'm sorry. I'm slow. But Explore Ecology um, can continue to deliver those services. Um, and secondly, I, I'd like to um, uh, talk about the, um, about the need to really look at the plans of new development and ensure that they've planned for the waste stream, just as you're saying, Mr. Four. And by the way, it was great seeing you and your kids on the train at train day. That was so much fun. Um, Planning Commission, ABR, and HLC um, have opportunities to ensure that those designs um, really do conform to the need for functionality when it's all said and done. And the question I have, and I don't have the answer, but I just raise it, is do we need uh, an ordinance modification change? Do we need to relook at the building code? Is there a line that goes in there somewhere? Uh, but these are things that um, should become um, just a standard operating procedure in the design review process at whatever level. And I appreciate you raising this so it's not an afterthought. So um, I don't know when the answer would come, but I, I'm, I'm open to us looking at uh, what we can do to kind of codify this so that it doesn't have to be a discretionary thing each and every time and wonder, you know, and then get forgotten and then we later have to pick up the pieces. Mr. Francisco. Thank you. Um, I would have, on that same topic about the, the amount of waste generated by different kinds of operations, I would have assumed that that, that there's a manual somewhere that already has that information. Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember um, Francisco, there are manuals. I mean, in fact, the city has an enclosure uh, design manual from 10 years ago. And so to, to get to your point, you know, along the continuum of what we're trying to achieve, um, the first is that we're trying to make sure that we understand what's generated. We, uh, you know, the, the the characterization of solid waste tends to change if you look at it over a decade. Packaging changes. We have four streams now where we're taking organics out of the waste stream, uh, which is usually about 30%. So we want to make sure that we're correct. And we understand the, uh, we understand the densities and the weights of that material better, but we want to make sure that we're accurate. And so in terms of our overall plan, the first was to uh, develop those uh, waste generator profiles or verify that they're still accurate. Second, revise those voluntary enclosure standards that we had previously developed to take advantage or to account for uh, changes in collection, changes in vehicles, changes in um, setbacks and you know, things like that that we see. And then thirdly, you know, bring it back to council and say, this is what we've done on a voluntary basis. Is there anything else you'd like us to do? But we were only prepared to go as far as the voluntary stage now, um, and we're making really good progress. I think that every plan that we can make changes to on paper and ensure adequate space saves down the road dozens of hours of our outreach staff trying to untangle these, um, these bin sharing agreements from undersized enclosures. Okay, uh, and then the other thing I'd like to ask, could you please forward to us a list of the positions and responsibilities in your department? Thank you very much. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was going to go back to the Explore Ecology subject for a moment, um, and I don't really fully understand our relationship with them, to be honest with you, uh, as it stands, but as we look to implement or I guess was change the curriculum or update the curriculum as you were talking about before. Is there a, uh, a, skill set or a skill set or capability that doesn't exist with Explore Ecology that you're looking for somewhere else? Is that, I guess I'd, I'm really not sure what, uh, mm -hmm. what, what we're doing here. So. Yeah, I mean, I I'd like to be clear. You know, we appreciate the work that Explore Ecology has done. They've been our contractor for 20 years. But on the flip side, they've been our only contractor for 20 years. One of the things I think we're interested in is what else is out there. You know, we could work together with Explore Ecology, but we'd be going through just about the same steps in saying, well, we'd like you to develop this sort of proposal. I mean, it's essentially going to be a sole source proposal with a, con with a contractor. As long as we're going through all those steps, my feeling is put it out there. We, we live in a town with several colleges a major university, a litany of nonprofits, I'm interested to see what comes back. You know, what competition yields innovation. Competition build, you know, yields good
good pricing and it yields creativity. I'd like to see what's out there because we, you know, we have unreached populations, we have language barriers, we have different demographics. I'd like to see what somebody comes up with and says, hey, you know, your residential recycling rate has essentially flatlined over the 10 years. We think by capturing the students in these grades uh, this way, you know, it could be a skit, could be a video, could be a, a notebook, whatever it is they come up with, I want to see what, what's out there that would be best practices that we could then uh, arm a contractor with, such as Explore Ecology, with better curriculum and go out and do, uh, do the job that aligns to the city's goals. I, I mean, I would fully expect Explore Ecology to be one of the proposers for this. I just like to see who else is out there. It's a big state. You know, a lot of people do this and they don't need to be local to develop the curriculum. I think it's a good idea that they be local if they're going to go into our schools, but in terms of developing the curriculum, I don't think we need to limit ourselves to this locality. Right, no, and I completely see your point in terms of, of, of reaching out and seeing what's out there and what's available. The other side of the coin is there is going to be a period of time where that program is going to take a hit. And I said, I'm just saying, I know as much about the program as I've heard in these last few minutes, so I'm not that familiar with it. But to me, it would almost make more sense, if this is in fact a valuable program, and if we really do want to make this outreach, wouldn't it make more sense to somehow continue the program at status quo and then do the RFP on top of that as opposed to cutting the program to fund the RFP? I mean, to me, you're going to have this lag time where you're going to lose whatever outreach you're going to have for those students for that period. So, I, you know. Yeah, it's a, I mean, you raise good points. I think uh, there are a couple points on that that I, would, that I would offer. The first is I don't think that a short-term hiatus where Explore Ecology is still uh, in classrooms for the one module will close the door with the school district. We have too strong of a relationship with the school district. We are, you know, we talk to their superintendent and their administration. We, like I said, we've been at five of their schools in the past two weeks. We sit on their sustainability committee. We are standing presence there. I don't think the door will close, um, but it's a risk, you know. And the other issue is outside of additional grant funding, there's a finite amount of outreach that we need to do. You know, we have, we still have a whole new contract to, to educate, you know, residents and businesses and multi-unit property owners alike about the new services, how to use them, and how to save money through increased recycling. We have a single-use bag ordinance that may be coming down the pike. So uh, part of it is just a, you know, an issue of where we see um, you know, what it is that you would like us to put in place in FY14. That said, we are open to, uh, we're open to anything, and we, we, we will take the direction. Mr. Samario? Yeah, I just wanted to say we're, we're not talking about a lot of money. If, the, if it's the council's pleasure to sort of continue the contract with um, Explore Ecology but still do this RP, we're going to need to spend $15,000 or find $15 to do that. We could find it. it just we're, we're have, We have a tight budget. We talked about the long-term goal of trying to rebalance. So we are just being sensitive to the funds that are needed. But, you know, if it's the council's pleasure, I, we have no problem spending the $15,000 and still maintaining that so we don't have any downtime. But, you know, we could be, um, you know, we would want to put out this ultimate curriculum out to bid to see who might be able to do it locally, and Arts from Scratch could certainly be a proposal. But, again, not a lot of money, so whatever the council would, would like us to do is fine. Thank you. Ms. Maria? Thank you. I have a couple of questions. I will address the Explore Ecology issue, um, but on page H164, Mr. Four, notice, no, Number of calls handled by code enforcement staff. Like, what are they called for related to solid waste? Uh, Council Member Mario, they're uh, primarily uh, illegal accumulation of waste. So that's probably the number one call that we get is somebody saying, my neighbor has inadequate trash service or has not signed up for trash service, and there's a big, you know, uh, mess of trash all the way up to the classic hoarding case. You know, we get those. So that's... That's primarily the, the, the private property case we get, and then we also get some, um, uh, you know, curbside and, and uh, street side dumping that we take care of. Well, sometime I'd like to see a photograph of the hoarding. I love that show. So if you, I think there would just be interesting. Oh, I've got some good ones for you. Okay, good. <laughs> sometime please uh, bring it. 
Um, and then it, it panics me a little bit that we're looking at 2015 with, I mean, are you using the expression deficit of $300,000? You know, we've just gone through this process of negotiating this huge contract, $16 million a year for 10 years, and we didn't exact enough franchise fees or, I mean, how is it that we're, you know, look, we're a, a Charles Dickens orphan right here going, wow, we're, how, we're so much money is here. How are we not uh, solvent? I'm not ragging you. I'm, I'm it's trying to support you, and I'm sorry that this is the case, Mr. Four. Hey, Councilmember Mario, the I, I would call your attention to you know yes we we are projecting a three hundred thirteen thousand dollar deficit in FY fifteen, right. but in FY thirteen we are projecting a surplus of two hundred forty thousand dollars, so the net difference is about seventy three thousand dollars in FY fifteen, so essentially we're going to make a big deposit at the end of FY thirteen and draw down on those reserves in FY fifteen. So the net difference is about 73. Okay. Um, one of the things that that we alluded to uh, previously is that, you know, of our 2.6 million dollar budget, a big chunk of that, about 450 thousand dollars this next year, is is based upon highly volatile recycling markets, and so that's really where our vulnerability is now. Um, you'll notice that. Um, well, I don't think you can see it on the budget pages, but. Uh, in FY14, we are expecting to receive $450,000 in recycling revenue from the county. In FY15, we already know, because we're paid in arrears, that that number is $125,000. So that's a $325,000 swing in one year. Uh, and that's, that's why we're having, that's one of the reasons why we're having trouble uh, staying balanced year to year. Well, I will look forward to your strategies for, for being balanced. And then on the explore ecology issue, I do wish that we would continue to work with that very valuable partner. And um, I'm sorry they changed their name because Art from Scrap is like on the tongue of every child and teenager who went through the program. And they're very creative people. I know uh, Jill Cloutier from when I was at the radio station. And there's... Uh, Stephen McIntosh is an expert in uh, solid waste, and so I think there really is the expertise there uh, to uh, uh, forge an, an educational plan. They're experts in talking to children, and I and I I mean, separate from that, I really would hate to see the number go from 2,000 or 2,500 to 700, even for a year or two. You know, we have their. <clears throat> their young minds to influence, you know, in in a, in a short in a short window. Uh, so I would I would support um, you continuing to work with Explore Ecology. Thank you, Mr. House. I had um, meant to ask this before, and I'm glad that Ms. Muriel uh, just brought it up. And it's the, uh, the the fact that we got presented today, distinct from in, in our book, uh, the 2014 budget, but not the, t the two year budget. And so. Um, I really would like to make sure that in the presentation for those who are watching who don't have the benefit of reading this right now, um, what you see is a distinction. Certainly, um, you must, have, must be anticipating some longer-term strategy for smoothing the ups and downs of a volatile recycling market. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. And if there's anything else that distinguishes 2014 from 2015 so we can have that heads up and the public can hear about it as well. I mean, obviously, if it's just status quo, then you can say that. But if there's any other high points, you should probably let us know right now. Uh, Councilmember House, you know, the, I think where we are right now with, with the overall budget is we have put our finger on one of the primary problems, which is the volatile recycling revenue. Um, our goal is in the next couple of months to come back with a series of options for, you know, for your consideration in the out years. Um, you know, one thing we do know is that just as recycling markets go down, they tend to come up. And so um, we will be trying to identify some threshold level where we know, you know, a reasonable amount of recycling revenue that will come in. Uh, on the, on the high years, we'll put that into reserves, and then we'll draw down on that as we need to um, you know, in the down years, um, but that's, you know, that's certainly going to be one of the options. 
And if I could, I, our goal is to get to a point where we're not relying on any of our recycling revenues to meet our operating costs, that any recycling revenues we get, we, we build up into our reserves, and then when they go down, you know, we might have to use them. But, again, I would like to be able to ultimately just have, a, you know, appropriate level reserves, and then any excess we get above that from recycling revenues we would use to abate rate increases in the future, but still having all of our costs covered by the fees and not relying at all on recycling revenues. And that's what we're going to be talking about next, you know, when we bring this back next year as part of a mid-cycle review, and it might require a rate increase. We didn't want to sort of keep adding on other rate increases to this, to this contract because we already had a lot of things going on. They went up by a million dollars already just for new services. We incorporated the, the concession into that, those fees that we were getting from the haulers. So, you know, we, we thought, is this the time to layer another three or $400,000 worth of cost on, those, on the rate payers? So we said, let's look, take a look what the recycling revenues are going to do, pay attention, and if we need to do something next year, we would, and we'll, of course, bring it to you, a, a proposed plan for um, getting back in balance. I appreciate hearing the strategy out loud. And I, I think that's important because we've just gone through so much to get to where we are right now. And I, I, I agree. I mean, the ratepayers are wondering. And so for us to be able to have a, a long-term strategy of how to smooth this out is really important. And I don't know how the conversion technology piece of it fits into it. I mean, it's just that could that just maybe is a wild card. But I remember hearing um, uh, Mr. Mustang, what's his name? Uh, that John, uh, yeah, just appreciating his his thought that you know he he intends to hold. Uh, actually inventory, if you will, some of those resources and, and, and hit the market at the high points. And we're not really, I guess, in that position. But whatever strategies we have to spare the rate payers uh, any more volatility, I'd really appreciate hearing more about that. Well, thank you for the presentation. I'll just add about the um, Explore Ecology and the um, RFP. It, I mean, 20 years doing the same thing, it's probably worth looking at that. I just don't think um, our current contract uh, recipient should get the hit that late and so and, and to have some sort of continuity. So if we can find 15,000, keep things on the status quo with the current curriculum, I don't think it's doing any harm to, you know, uh, and uh, but open it up and, and, and do everything that you said in terms of what is out there and put out a comprehensive RFP. I'm sure Explore Ecology will submit a proposal and probably a very good one that we look at very carefully. But um, not to have them be uh, get the hit for our process of wanting to move forward with expanding or um, just changing our process. So uh, I think we can probably find $15,000 somewhere and do that. And uh, they, they have, then have a bigger issue of if they can win the contract in the future. So, And I think I heard that from some of my colleagues as well. So, yep. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>